Good afternoon. I'm Barry Pavel, a senior vice president here at the Atlantic Council, as well as the director of our Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security. And I'm really pleased to welcome so many of you to our Forward Defense Initiative's latest event, the future of artificial intelligence in national security and defense. As we face a major inflection point in the way we prepare for and conduct military operations, this event will serve as an opportunity to examine the challenges of and the key priorities for developing artificial intelligence, or AI, moving forward. The event is also the culmination of an eight-month Atlantic Council research effort on this issue in collaboration with our partners at Accrete AI as we launch our latest report entitled Eye to Eye in AI, Developing Artificial Intelligence for National Security and Defense by our senior fellows Margarita Konaev and Tate Nurkin. I'm pleased to welcome a variety of very distinguished voices to our event today. In particular, we have the distinct honor of a defense keynote address from the director of the Defense Department's Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, Lieutenant General Michael Gru Gruen. General, thank you so much for joining us. He will be followed by a panel on the integration of artificial intelligence for national security and defense, featuring the Atlantic Council's Margarita Kanaev, the Defense Innovation Unit's Jamie Fitzgibbon, and the Special Competitive Studies Project's Justin Lynch. This will be moderated by Politico's Lee Hudson. After that, we'll welcome Prashant Buyan, the founder and CEO of our close partner, Accrete AI, to the stage for his industry keynote address. And then we'll transition to a second panel on industry's critical role in developing AI, featuring Prashant, Stephen Escovaraj from Booz Allen Hamilton, Ron Keesing from Lidos, and Amanda Muller from Northrop Grumman Corporation. And this will be moderated by our very own senior advisor, Stephen Rodriguez. I'd like to thank these speakers for joining us, uh, our partners at Accrete AI for a very close collaborative effort on our report and this event, and our audience for tuning in virtually to this really important conversation. Thank you very much, and now to General Groyan. Great. Th thank you, Barry. I really appreciate the introduction. Um, and uh, and uh, thanks to the Atlantic Council for uh, for hosting this really important dialogue. It's, it's it's critical that we have this, and now is the time to do it. As what we think about is a is a transformation of warfare. And as we uh, as we think about the transformation of warfare, we think about the role of data, of analytics, of artificial intelligence, and all the artifacts of an information age. And we can clearly see that in the environment around us. Um, so. You know, we think about AI and artificial intelligence and what's at stake. You know, one is this transformation of warfare, and obviously we see that happening in, uh, you know, in Ukraine today, where dismounted infantry with precision munitions can, uh, you know, can, can wreak havoc on large-scale armored formations. Um, I don't think the Russians today are asking whether or, or wishing that they had bought more tanks. Right? They're wishing they would have bought something else. So what is that something else that we need to bring into this conversation about the transformation of warfare? I think about it through, uh, you know, through the lens of, uh, you know, strangely enough, like lancers, right? The men on horseback with, with wooden sticks, with iron spikes on the end, riding into machine guns in 1914. Lancers with sticks against guns that were machines because although they were citizens of the industrial age, they did not recognize the ramifications of the industrial age on warfare. And I think that we could find ourselves in a very similar situation today. Um, and uh, I, you know, I, I, again, referring back to uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln, right? As our case is new, uh, so we must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then we shall save our country. And the most important word there is disenthrall. When we think about the things that enthrall us, that cause us to fail to, to see the bigger picture that block our minds to take, to take in the, the, the scale of the transformation and the things that we have to do. And this is what we're trying to, uh, to avoid by drawing attention to this technology and related technologies inside the Department of Defense through the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the Defense Digital Service, the Advana platform, the Chief Data Officer platform, and all of that coming together to, to, to form the Chief Digital and AI Office for the Department of Defense. And we'll talk about that later. 
But clearly the competition is around us. Uh, you know, the, the estimate recently was about a, the evolution of a $16 trillion industry by 2030, um, which will uh, raise GDP significantly for both China and the US and to a lesser degree our European partners and then to a, a lesser degree still across the globe. But a bump in GDP of 16 trillion across the, uh, across the globe is a massive uh, opportunity. And through that opportunity and that level scale of transformation uh, in the market, um, that has real ramifications for both war fighting and, uh, our, and our war fighting competitive, competitiveness and also our economic competitiveness and, 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 uh, and our national strength and our national influences. So, um, so it's clear that uh, you know, as that competition, as that com competition comes to light, um, it, it's, it's easy to look at uh, the, 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 the PLA, the People's Liberation Army's plans for the same technology. Clearly articulated a goal to be dominant in AI by 2030. Clearly articulated to have a fully modernized People's Liberation Army by 2027. Uh, now executing their 14th five-year plan, moving into their 15th five-year plan that will take them to 2030. Uh, I imagine when you look at the U.S. defense process, we are right now building POM 24 to 28. Um, and those dates, un maybe uncomfortably, maybe comfortably, overlap to quite a degree. And I guess the question for us is, are we competitive? Are our investments that we're making today competitive in this environment? And this is something that we're really working hard at inside the department. So inside the department, you know, clearly there's a, there's a, there's a question about uh, you, you know, what is AI for the department? And uh, although there are conversations about killer robots and, and all the rest, um, I think the, the, the reality is much more mundane. Uh, as we look at the ecosystem around us, the business environment, the, uh, the production environment, the investment environment, all driven by artificial intelligence, it's easy for us to see models for how we need to transform the department. And this is what we're after. Um, you know, and, and so, so that, uh, you, you know, do we think about you know, the, the natural language processing, for example, or chat bots that, uh, you know, that are readily available to help you know, answer questions you know, within service administration functions, for example. Uh, our ability to gain the same degree of like, efficiency and productivity as the commercial environment when, we're start, when we talk about the business of the department. Auditability, for example, is always a significant conversation for the department. So how do we become auditable? How do we manage that data environment? How do we generate the analytics and the insights from artificial intelligence to actually uh, manage the department much more effectively. And of course, that's augmented by our warfighting gains and what we, what we hope to achieve through warfighting. Um, the, the, in in warfighting, each joint capability area, each warfighting function has an identified path for how artificial intelligence can help, uh, help that, that, that uh, functional capability accelerate uh, its outcomes in, a, you know, in, in, a, in the coming competition. Uh, for us, accelerating our ability to, uh, to, to, to observe, to orient, decide, and act, uh, it becomes really an, a key, uh, you know, keyly enabled by artificial intelligence, and this is what we're after. Um, implementation in the department, of course, is, is, is always a challenge. Um, as new technology meets uh, uh, legacy processes, legacy organizations, and, uh, and legacy technology. And so we'll talk about, um, um, you know, as we, want, as, we, as we gain both efficiency and productivity in our, in our business functions inside the department, how do we gain that same kind of efficiency? And a lot of that uh, begins with education. How do we teach the department how to, how to recognize the gains and look for the gains in artificial intelligence? And this is very much, you know, we still have a lot of conversations that start with it. Uh, what will it do, right, for example, when speaking about artificial intelligence? And so we spend a lot of time in education to help people understand that just like an automobile extends your capabilities in the physical domain, artificial intelligence extends your abilities within the, uh, within the uh, data domain and the information domain. And so, like, how do you use machines to augment your processes and your capabilities? Uh, in implementation, uh, I, uh, just to talk about implementation just a bit here, uh, implementation, of course, is the key to successful transformation. And implementation is e extraordinarily challenging uh, as artificial intelligence and related technologies cross, cross cut not just uh, you know, service lines, but almost every procedural line or process line across the department. And so like reinventing how the department deals with quickly modernizing technology becomes a really uh, important mandate. Um, I, 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 I think about it through the lens of, uh, uh, you know, on the backside of a dollar bill, 
there's the pyramid with, uh, with an eye on the top, right? And so we have been tasked in the Joint Artificial Intelligence Center to, uh, you know, to, hey, let's adopt and integrate artificial intelligence. And as we approached that problem, looking at that eye, we realized that, you know what, if we're trying to build that eye, we actually need to have build the entire pyramid first, right? And so that pyramid is things like oh, an educated workforce. That pyramid is a thing like uh, a much different approach to acquisition. Uh, things like uh, the, the relationship between functional capability and uh, 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 technical capability. It's tempting to say, well, let's just bring a bunch of technicians into the department, technical expertise. But we can't forget in the employment of the technology, the difference between a technology and a capability is the ability to turn that technology into warfighting outcomes or, 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 uh, or, or business outcomes. And this is where we are today, trying to, trying to marry up the technology and the, uh, and the uh, functional expertise so that we can start to rapidly gain an accelerating tempo of AI implementation across the department. Um, Education is key, technical expertise, expert, uh, expertise is key, cultural artifacts are probably the largest uh, obstacle. When we talk about AI implementation in the department, um, my estimation is maybe it's 85% cultural rather than, rather than technical. And, and, the, and the reason I say that, you know, when you think about all of the lines that the implementation of a, of a technology at scale crosses, those are budgetary lines, those are uh, acquisition lines, those are service lines. Uh, you think about the, you know, the Department of Defense, which is largely a, uh, it was born as a, as a department that, that was a software, or I'm sorry, a, a domain-specific hardware acquisition entity. That is, each service, uh, which, which retains a high degree of sovereignty over its budget and its, and its warfighting capability, um, uh, operates within a department that, uh, that loosely aligns the, uh, you know, the, the pursuit of domain capabilities you know, by each one of those specific services. And, and maybe that worked in the 1960s, where you could spend lots of time defining hardware requirements, for example, years perfecting a requirement then to allow industry to build that. In, clearly, in an information age, it can't work that way. And so like gaining the processes so that we can acquire largely software-based capabilities requires a major cultural shift inside the Department of Defense. And that shift is underway as more and more people understand the, uh, not only just the, not, not just the opportunities, but the risks of not being competitive, the risks of not moving fast enough to ensure that we, can, we, 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 we retain a competitive edge uh, in, in any theater against any opponent. And this is what we're spending a lot of time to do today. So those cultural, cultural artifacts, whether that's policy, whether that's uh, uh, dealing with service budgets and service budget execution, um, you know, getting authorization to operate on networks, ATO networks and network policy, network security, um, the, 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 you know, the, the role of the department in all of those things, the relationship of the department with the services becomes a key conversation. Uh, in this case, as we seek to, uh, to use the department to accelerate the, the, the advancement or the implementation of this trans transformation, the department plays a role that maybe it hadn't played in the past. The department becomes much more of a doer uh, and, a, you know, a, and, a, and a, an advisor and an illuminator of what's possible in the state of the art for the rest of the department to start to build an enterprise of capability. It's clear that no service capability on its own is adequate and that we have to think about how do we fight at scale across all the domains in an integrated way that doesn't have uh, seams in between our decision processes or our operational execution. And this is what we hope to achieve with artificial intelligence inside the department. One of the key obstacles is, is, uh, is tribalism. And, uh, and un unfortunately for all of us, tribalism is firmware, right? It, it, is, it is deep within us, and, and I think almost every organization struggles with this. But inside the department, you have natural tribalism not lines and natural tribalism um, uh, obstacles. And so moving past tribalism, learning to work as an integrated whole, being willing to share capabilities and technologies across service lines, across functional lines, and be able to do that uh, in support of combatant commanders with their difficult missions is, is the charter of the Jake. It will be this charter of the, uh, of the CDAO as the CDAO uh, becomes uh, 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 full, uh, fully operational capable. And so, so 
I, we, we believe that you know, a lot of the rules have to change. A lot of the thought processes have been rendered obsolete and maybe the you know, kind of the cores of how our organizational processes work have to be reevaluated through the lens of artificial intelligence and, and data. Um, if it, you know, I, I use as a, as a metric for where we are in this conversation, you know, clearly uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jeff Bezos in 2002 issued his famous uh, directive, right? That, that you know, hey, all, all Amazon components would, would get onto that same data plane. There would be one set of data that was definitive across the organization, and that data would drive all the operations. That was 2002. It's now 2022, and it's time for the Department of Defense to have a, have a similar focus on using data to solve problems, to think about their problems through a data lens, and to start to, start to implement the capabilities, uh, overcoming the, cu the cultural obstacles, to actually become a competitive uh, 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 enterprise that can, that can uh, you know, out outfight any, any opponent and, uh, and has the same s the level of productivity and efficiency that we desire uh, you know, for, for our taxpayers. And uh, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Lee Hudson, defense reporter at Politico. Thank you for joining us today for a panel on defense integration of artificial intelligence. Joining me today is Dr. Margarita Kanaev, a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. She actually just authored a report, I think it was released about an hour ago, on developing AI for national security and defense. We also have Jamie Fitzgibbon, the Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning Program Manager from the Pentagon's Defense Innovation Unit. And finally, we have Justin Lynch, the Director of Research and Analysis from the Special Competitive Studies Project. Uh, before we begin, I want to remind the audience to please uh, send us your questions using the Q&A function on Zoom. Um, and to start us off, I was hoping each of the panelists could give a uh, brief opening remarks. Thank you. Yeah. About the report that me and my amazing co-author, Tate Nurkin, who is also a fellow here at the Atlantic Council, um, have worked on for the past eight months. Unfortunately, Tate couldn't be here today but he did want me to relay that any problems that anyone might have with the report should be relayed directly to him. So <laughs> very much appreciate that. Um, so we started this report with an idea that, you know, when you're thinking about AI and national security and AI and defense, there are just so many issues and so many venues to address it. And we decided that an important focus is one on the relationship between DOD and industry. So uh, obviously, like I said, it's impossible to tackle the entire problem, but this was a critical element as we move from this consensus that we increasingly have between DOD and industry that AI is quite important and potentially revolutionary for the future of warfare to understanding really how do we integrate it, how do we adopt it at scale across the national security and defense apparatus. And the, after doing the interviews and doing the research and having conversations with industry leaders, with defense leaders, with policy personnel, the best way that I've heard it describe the current landscape is that we are working towards a common goal, but unfortunately on parallel tracks. Essentially, this means we have a common understanding that AI is fundamental to the future of national security and warfare, but the way that we are trying to accomplish implementing AI is really not unified, not cohesive and not as well worked out as it could be um, if we want to ensure that we are competitive in the future and protected. So with that in mind, uh, our report essentially outlined three key areas that we think that industry and DOD need to become better aligned in terms of their perspectives, their priorities, and crucially, their timelines, because you will hear a lot here that timelines and trajectories are often very much 
not unified and not compatible with how quickly things move in the private sector to versus how slowly they move in the public sector. So how do we go about aligning these perspectives, these priorities, and these timelines? Uh, first of all, one of the key takeaways and recommendations in our report focuses on making sure that we continue to invest in safe, secure, trusted, and reliable AI. You will hear a lot about the urgency of implementing AI, magnified by the strategic competition with China, the changing nature of warfare, and the massive promise that AI has. That is all absolutely true and correct. But rushing towards the operational deployment of untested technologies that have not been effectively verified or assured, that have not, where um, warfighters have not had the opportunity to develop the necessary levels of trust with them, where we have not ensured that they are reliable in battle, will end up being counterproductive. So making sure that we're you know, keeping a close alignment to the DOD ethical principles, to the DIU principles for implementing, uh, for the guidelines for procurement uh, and uh, contracting that seek to implement those uh, ethical principles into the actual process of sourcing these technologies, working with the testing uh, protocols within DOD to make sure that they are also closely aligned to what we see as the strategic advantage that the United States military has, and that is its moral and ethical code when it comes to war fighting. So we absolutely have to make sure that our AI journey, our journey towards implementing AI across DOD, proceeds along the lines of these ethical principles. The second point is that it is increasingly clear that if DOD wants to meet its goals in AI, it has to be able to work closely and effectively with different types of industry and commercial actors. And that ranges from you know, the, tr the true and trusted and familiar defense primes, the major companies responsible for implementing and supplying you know, those legacy systems, those uh, crucial technologies that DOD has come to rely on for a long time, to leaders in the technology space like Google or Amazon or these massive companies that are you know, leading the technology globally, as well as with commercial players that are newcomers to the government space that have made significant progress in commercial technologies and are you know, more recently seeing potential in working with the government and working with DOD because we all know that uh, AI is inherently a dual use technology. But for the DOD to be able to do that effectively, we have also heard a lot about the barriers that come with the budgeting process, that come with the acquisition process, the contracting challenges. So coordinating more effectively on implementing those reforms, we know is not going to be an easy change. And the general here discussed about so much of it being a cultural problem and a systemic problem at that. But while we are progressing towards more of a cultural shift or even a systemic upheaval of the budgeting process and the procurement protocols that DOD has had for a time and a period that was perhaps simpler than the one that we're living in now, um, there are still things that can be done in parallel. And one of those things is focusing on the strategically located individuals within the system, and those being the individuals that are responsible for procurement. So the procurement professionals, who are the ones that are tasked with working most directly with the companies that are supplying some of the most innovative technologies. So training them more effectively to understand digital technologies and AI and software to make sure that they feel comfortable and are best equipped to um, you know, pursue some of those opportunities without uh, significant risks, that they're open to experimentation, that they have the correct tools to work more effectively with the private companies, these non-traditional vendors. It's something that we can do in parallel while we're pursuing the more larger scale changes. And finally, and I'm not sure this is going to be a really popular point, 
but it's not just about DOD and industry. It's about what happens within the industry itself and between these integrators, the large scale primes and the more tradi non-traditional um, innovative companies that are just coming to the surface now and the DOD has been pursuing in the last couple of years much more seriously through efforts like DIU. Make sure that they can work together effectively despite recognizing that of course there are different incentives and their economic and uh, you know, financial competition and legal issues at bay, but making sure that they can work effectively from the stages of the most innovative ideas to prototyping to then integrating these uh, prototypes and these ideas into the existing legacy system, existing software, existing hardware that DOD relies on is going to be critical to moving forward. So it's not just about DOD and industry, it's about the relationship and linkages within the technology in, and defense industry itself. So I'll stop here, but I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. Yes, um, Jamie, would you like to go? Sure. Um, well, I did not release a report that I'm going to be able to, to highlight right now. I will say, uh, you know, in and out of the government, 18 years uh, doing digital transformation and digital modernization, um, I, I think was blown out of the water when I spent the last six years in Silicon Valley and really being challenged in their approach to uh, moving forward, challenging status quo, the speed at which they um, fail fast and test and deploy and then fix it and deploy and fix it and deploy rather than overcorrecting or waiting for perfect. Um, all of that has really helped me in the role uh, at DIU where our goal is to help bridge that mindset back to the DOD kind of, um, what was it uh, General Groen said about our firmware? Uh, so kind of shaking that up a little bit and, and helping us revisit why we make those, those acquisition decisions why we invest in our technologies the way we do, when we do, and when do we modernize, and where do we modernize, and really kind of revisiting that partnership with those integrators, those uh, capabilities, as um, Rita mentioned, that we've relied on, that are core capabilities, but bringing in some competition, shaking it up a little bit, and really allowing us to get uncomfortable uh, to allow for that innovation to really take hold. Uh, so thanks for the opportunity to be part of the discussion. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about how AI is already changing warfare and will change warfare in the next few years. Uh, I do need to give the disclaimer up front in a very DC way that SESP, where I, I work, hasn't released any public information about this yet. So this is all really my opinion uh, more than anything else. Um, so I'll, I'll describe a couple of the capabilities that we're seeing already and starting to see develop and then describe a little bit more how together they'll change uh, how we see warfighting and warfare take place. Um, so first, I think we can safely say now that we're entering, entering a world where there's widespread persistent surveillance. Uh, some of that's coming already from the proliferation of traditional intelligence assets uh, like satellites uh, that we've seen already. Uh, but then some of that's also uh, coming from new sensors. Um, the, the easiest example, low-hanging fruit, is of course the, the smartphones that uh, most of us are carrying right now. But then there's surveillance of online behavior and quite a few others as well, all of which are fed into really powerful analytics that are powered by the AI that we're talking about today. That surveillance that's widespread and pretty consistent and constant um, is enabling what we can call micro-targeting at scale. That's, that's a term that's come out of the advertising industry uh, already, but in a military application, what that really means is the tailored targeting of individuals, large numbers of individuals, with both kinetic and non-kinetic effects to produce a particular outcome that you're looking for strategically. So that, that's the first uh, capability that, that's really interesting that comes out of AI and is new. Um, the second one is that advances in computing combined with modern game engines together are producing some really exciting things in modeling and simulation. And they're giving opportunities for leaders to look at their different courses of action that they have available and generate new courses of action in a much, much larger uh, and more granular decision space than they've had available before from traditional wargaming. Uh, that has really interesting applications for the tactical and operational level of war. Uh, but then you also get to see some really interesting applications for acquisition and procurement, where you can look at things on a unified single platform and then game them out a little bit more than you might be able to, and more realistically than you would be able to otherwise. Um, so that'll affect a lot of our decision making. Uh, 
Uh, and then there's a, a lot of other capabilities, just to briefly mention, like some things with human machine teaming that are emerging, autonomous swarms, uh, and then really rapidly accelerating adaptation that have been addressed really thoroughly uh, in other places and in the report. I don't want to go into detail there because of that. But when you combine all those capabilities that I just mentioned together, you, you get in some changes in how warfighting will be experienced and how militaries are going to prosecute wars. Um, and so very briefly, um, one of the first is that data collection and management, like General Gruen said, is going to be much more important than it has been in the past. Now, there, there are some things that are very our forces oriented, blue force oriented, where you can say building out the right data architecture, the right sensors, the right software to be able to integrate them. Those are all incredibly important, and, and that's correct. But there are a lot of things that are important operationally as well uh, for our warfighters to understand that collecting the right type of data and effective data about our adversaries is a tactical advantage that preventing adversaries from doing the same thing to us is also a tactical advantage, and that data poisoning is going to be part of their, their life now. Um, that, that's incredibly important and is different from what you call traditional intelligence and counterintelligence work. Um, it also means that peacetime surveillance is going to be inc increasingly important. The, the second change, uh, and this is where sometimes people uh, use the word dystopian, is uh, the individualization of war. So in, historically, gaining strategic effect required uh, destroying or threatening to destroy a large portion of some, an adversary's army or some other state resource that was highly valued. And increasingly we're seeing that you can significantly disrupt military operations and possibly even reach strategic effect by targeting key individuals. It might not be a small number of them, but you're targeting key individuals in a very precise way. And that targeting could mean coercion, uh, blackmail, it could mean very kinetic targeting in the traditional, se traditional sense we mean, or it could be mean targeted information campaigns, uh, which is also very feasible. And then the third change, uh, and to echo uh, Margarita, is this is one that people sometimes uh, find unpopular, is a reduction in continuity. So as adaptation and planning takes place at machine speeds, which we're beginning to see already and we'll see more and more as time goes on, then the, thing, the things that worked well in one engagement will work less well in the next engagement at increasingly faster rates. Sometimes they won't work uh, well at all because machines are able to adapt to things properly supervised, tested, and evaluated at a rate that humans have a hard time doing. Mm -hmm. um, so those reductions in, in continuity uh, have some really significant implications for how we fight as well. It means that creative problem solving will be increasingly important. It also means that certain types of experience, not, not all experience, but certain types of experience will be relatively less valuable than they have been in the past, which is certainly a big change to the way we train and educate our warfighters. And, uh, there's, I could go on for quite a while. I'm excited to talk about some of the obstacles and ways that uh, Congress and the federal government can uh, bypass them, but I'll stop for now. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to kick things off by asking a question about Ukraine and how is war fighting, uh, how is AI changing war fighting or is it in Ukraine? Uh, did you want to go first, Dr. Kennedy? Surely. Um, so this is a difficult question for somebody who has been studying the Russian military with a focus on Russian military technology with a specialization in Russian military AI. Because if you've been following the past three months, the Russian military has struggled to pull itself out of the Ukrainian mud, let alone to employ AI and advanced technology effectively. So while engaging in this process of reflection and reassessment of how we do assessment and how we evaluate capabilities, how we think about the integration of emerging technologies into warfare, I think I've narrowed it down to two critical issues that are not just particular, let's say, to the pathologies of the US military, of the, excuse me, of the Russian military, which we can spend you know, the rest of the day talking about the problems, particular to the Russian military. Uh, the number one issue is the very critical difference between innovation and integration. Simply because we have seen the demonstration of certain technologies or certain capabilities, these one-off showcases, or even you know, some commercial developments that by no means should imply that they have been integrated at scale and that they are battle ready. I think that is something that we have to be really, really careful about when we are reading primary sources, including statements and assessments that are made by our competitors and adversaries about themselves 
as also when we are evaluating statements made by the companies that supply some of those technologies. So just being a little more careful and circumspect in terms of our analysis of what are concepts, what is at the R&D stage, what is at the experimentation stage, and what has been adopted and implemented at scale at a point where it is ready to be deployed on the battlefield. Because we've heard before that Russia has experimented with over 200 different types of new technologies in Syria and in its previous um, interventions in Ukraine. Clearly, that tells us something about the newness of those technologies, but it also tells us about the freedom of operation in those spaces, which it clearly has not had the similar freedom of operation in this war. And second, I think it really illustrates that whatever we are thinking about AI and autonomy and you know, generally on man technology and commercial technology, all of the developments that are being made, it's equally important that we invest in measures that protect against those advances. So every step that we take towards AI and autonomy, we have to be, every cent on AI and autonomy needs to be matched in counter AI and counter autonomy. It is truly shocking to see the level of destruction that relatively cheap Turkish drones have been able to inflict on very expensive and heavy Russian equipment. And we can talk again about individual Russian problems, but we should also be prepared that as these technologies become slightly more sophisticated and we don't have the necessary measures to protect against them, we might not be that much better prepared. I'll stop there. Yeah, thank you. Um, and Jamie, I was hoping you could paint a picture for us of how uh, research and development dollars have uh, changed over time, going from the government investing to industry really being at the forefront. And, uh, and also, if you wanted to touch on some of the projects that you're working on at the Defense Innovation Unit. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I would say, you know, in the 60s, we got things like the internet and duct tape, which is so important. MacGyver could not have done <laughs> half of what he did without duct tape. Um, and those, you know, there was so much government R&D funding. It was flush. And if you look at a, a chart, you'll, you know, DIU has a great chart we love showing. Uh, you'll just see this, the, the difference between commercial and government funding. Well, there, there had been this, this cross point in the late 80s, early 90s, and, and we haven't caught back up. And commercial has really just gone through the roof in its R&D investment. I'll give you, for instance, so DIU um, last six years has run 280-ish projects, prototypes. Um, we leveraged nine, just under 900 million US dollars to run those prototypes. Of that, we leveraged over 20 billion commercial R&D. So let that sink in. For 900 million over the last six years, we leveraged 20 billion of commercial private sector investment. And if you take this to the conversation of AI, government spending to commercial spending is one in 100. So, I mean, there, there is no, it, it, the game's over, right? We, we can't catch up with our own investment, and I don't think we should. And so now it comes back to a lot of what Rita mentioned, and, and DIU has been very careful about responsible AI. So if we're going to go out there and we're going to leverage commercial technologies for government use cases, specifically national security and defense, we need to make sure that we can trust those algorithms, that we, we can look under the hood, whether that's through model cards, whether that's through explainability, um, diagrams and checks or whatever, Gover uh, commercial can maintain proprietary things to some extent, but we have to know that we can trust that. And so that goes back to a bit of what you touch on in the report, um, that how incredibly important that is. However, we can't say the, if it's not built here, we can't use it. Because again, we're 1% one, 1 of the investment that's being made in advances and the speed at which AI is changing. 
And so at DIU, uh, we have uh, different portfolios. I happen to sit in the AIML uh, portfolio, but we have cyber, human systems, think about the wearables, um, uh, space, uh, autonomy, n new and emerging energies, and did I say cyber? I think I said cyber. And all of those leverage AI. So even though we have our own portfolio, it, it, it doesn't stop there. It crosses all these domains. Um, and so a lot of it today is looking at how do we leverage, you know, you talked about Ukraine and what's different with Ukraine. Well, let's look at the ISAF uh, engagement and Afghanistan. AI is run on uh, data. Data is essentially fuel. Out of Afghanistan, there was a little trickle of fuel. What we are getting since the start of this, uh, this operation in Ukraine is just a pipeline of data that then AI can leverage for good, bad, indifference, order of battle, supply chain, analytics, um, you know, disaster. Uh, we, we leverage commercial technologies for our um, satellite imagery. So that wasn't built by the government, but we can take all that data, commercial, and do something with it as far as informing um, uh, risk and operations. And um, so DIU, I would say, our, that, that is by far our biggest uh, selling point, is that we are trying to tap into what VCs and commercial companies are pouring into technology. And the speed, as I mentioned, speed at which they fail fast, they test it, they get it out there. There's a commercial backbone to this, which means businesses and customers have proven that capability. So now it's up to us to deploy it and prove it for some of these other um, you know, uh, advancing and, and constantly changing uh, security re requirements. Thank you. And uh, Justin, I wanted to ask you about workforce development and how the US and DOD and Congress can help uh, develop uh, an adequate AI workforce. Uh, thanks, that's a, a great question. So I, I worked at the National Security Commission on AI for uh, about two and a half years uh, on the, the workforce uh, line of effort. And one of the things that we broke out was this idea that we had several different workforce archetypes um, that the DOD needed to focus on developing and then understanding uh, how and where they would be distributed uh, across the DOD and across the different parts of the workforce, whether it's contractors, uh, service members, civilians, contracted companies, things like that. And to, to briefly summarize uh, what that looked like, um, there were three areas that really, really needed a lot of work. Um, the, the first are technical experts. Um, technical experts, engineers, um, people who have a certificate level on, of education uh, in artificial intelligence or specific tasks associated with it. Uh, and then your kind of your PhD level folks who are true AI researchers are incredibly important uh, across every part of AI adoption. Uh, they're important to understand uh, what AI can and cannot do, which is, is certainly a major issue in defense. Uh, and is, is changing pretty regularly as well. Uh, they're critical for understanding uh, what to buy and how to buy it to accomplish what we need to, which ties in very closely with both, what Jamie and Rita are both saying. Uh, and they're really important for being able to responsibly uh, deploy and then actually employ artificial intelligence-enabled technology as well. Uh, sometimes that means being pushed forward. Sometimes that means uh, being responsible and part of the, the development process. Uh, so we need to do a better job making sure that we're recruiting and building that part of our workforce as well. The, the second archetype uh, that's really important are, and, and General Gruen said this very well earlier, are uh, really well-informed end users. Uh, so end users are going to actually have to employ artificial intelligence enabled technology on a regular basis for garrison tasks and then for to be actually in the field to, to fight them uh, with them in war fighting. They're going to have to understand what that means for military operations. They're also going to have to understand what that means when their adversaries can do the same thing. That's going to change warfare in very real ways. It's already starting to happen. If we don't have informed end users, uh, then we won't be able to employ it well. Um, NSCI recommended that uh, end users be trained in five different topics um, that are generalizable across a bunch of different AI applications. That was problem curation, uh, data collection and management, the AI life cycle, uh, data visualization uh, and probabilistic reasoning, and then the last one is data-informed decision-making. With the belief that if you combine all five of those in that order, then you'll have someone who will know how to use AI-enabled systems well and understand what they need to do to make those systems work well and how to fight someone who's using it also. 
Uh, it's a tall order to have like five topics for service members who already have a very crowded training calendar and for DOD to create uh, programs and instruction for, for all of those. There are commercially uh, available lessons already though. That, that's a, a good start for what we think DOD would be able to do there. And then the, the third archetype that I think is arguably the most important are educated senior leaders who understand enough about artificial intelligence. They, some of them should be engineers, but certainly most of them don't have to be. Uh, but they understand enough to make the right choices to advance AI. Senior leaders make resource decisions. They set priorities for the department. They change some acquisition and procurement practices. And they change business practices too. Because if DoD is going to adopt AI effectively, you can't just keep doing business the way it did before and then layer on AI on top of it. You actually have to change your practices to take advantage of the automation scale and optimization that you get from AI. So senior leaders are really important for doing that and then for shaping personnel policies too. Um, so the good news on, on all three of these archetypes is that DOD and the broader federal government actually have made a lot of progress in the last several years as well uh, on this. Uh, OPM, our Congress has required OPM to create, I think it's five new occupational series uh, related to artificial intelligence and software development, uh, which is really exciting. Uh, for a, a certain population, that's really exciting. Uh, <laughs> then uh, DOD has also started to really invest, in, including at Jake and the CDAO, invest in educating senior leaders about artificial intelligence. Uh, and the services are doing some good work on identifying people who have programming proficiency and incentivizing them uh, to continue developing their proficiency. Um, there are a couple next steps. I think we could do um, more as a next step on building out informed end users in, in the way that I already mentioned. Uh, and then building out our civilian workforce uh, will be incredibly important as well. Um, NSCI recommended creating a digital service academy for that. I could probably go on about a digital service academy for about 30 minutes, uh, but I'll just quickly say that it would be a, a civilian degree granting program that would uh, produce digital experts who would have a five-year service obligation as civil servants in the government. And we think it's the best way to scale digital talent in the federal workforce. So I've gone on a little bit too long now. I'll stop there. Yeah. No, thank you. Uh, I wanted to switch gears a little bit and talk about trusted AI. Um, my question's for the group. How, how do you think the Pentagon can work with allies and partners on developing, adopting, and deploying trusted AI? That's such an important topic. It's really foundational, I think, to our ability to work effectively with allies and partners in the future, in the future fight and future warfare. Because fundamentally, if you have different levels of trust and comfort with new technologies, then your interoperability is very much contingent on whether you are able to trust and work with those technologies. And if you know your French allies have zero trust in AI and are fundamentally uncomfortable with uh, using it in weapon systems or for some stage of targeting, and we are you know, surging ahead with it, that is going to very much limit our ability to work with, let's say, our French allies, as just an example. So there are already you know, efforts and pathways to do that. And that includes in research and development, in some um, experimentation efforts, and some co-development of prototypes. Uh, of course, that is mostly being done with our closest allies, the ones that we have also intelligence sharing and agreements with, but it is not just an inside DOD or inside military effort. If anything, that's a space that really should broaden its perspective and bring in experts from academia, from industry, from other parts of uh, you know, the ecosystem to make sure that the uh, perspectives are really uh, cohesive and diverse, which is quite critical in this space. Do you have anything to add? Or? Yeah, I, I mean, I already mentioned the, R, the responsible AI yeah. uh, approach that, that DIU is using that hopefully is, it is crossing the U.S. government. It is becoming more of a principle, and there's a framework that is being developed from ODNI, um, you know, the Director of National Intelligence, through um, other, other stakeholders of the U.S. government. They're all thinking about responsible AI. If we're going to develop this, how do we make sure we can trust it? So that is one framework, which I hope can be shared, obviously, with our Five Eyes and others. And it already has. It's, there's no, nothing proprietary or special about that approach. But I also think the fact that we are leveraging commercial technologies to do these things, the interoperability challenges, I'm not going back to ISAF too much, but really, I mean, 
to, to build that network and to get that information sharing to happen, you had people using Yahoo accounts because they didn't even have a .mil account. And, and they had to come in and you had to trust them in this network. You had to trust that they understood cybersecurity to a certain level. There was a lot of trust just kind of thrown to the wind sometimes because you, you, you got to get the Blue Force tracker up and running and, and you, know, you have to do your ATOs to, to, to run the aircraft. We are now relying on something that is probably outside of any government ownership, but it's a commercial solution. So that helps sort of the interoperability pieces, mm -hmm. and then that trust is really dependent on how much do we allow visibility? Do we have metrics of accuracy? Do we have what we're flexible with slippage in algorithmic uh, use, right? Because it kind of drifts one way or the other. So what are those parameters that we accept and our coalition partners will accept? And then how do we actually think about something that is beyond just US developed? Mm -hmm. I, I agree very much with what they both said, especially about uh, co-development there. There's uh, a couple of other things. So one is that it's, it's helpful to not spend too much time differentiating AI from other command and control systems that we're using al already and developing already. Mm -hmm. And uh, co-developing AI and then making sure that our allies and partners trust AI enough um, is not a wholly different problem than tying them in and making sure that they're interoperable into other command and control systems that the services in DoD are developing like JADC2. Mm -hmm. um, there are already uh, really interesting, uh, complex challenges. Um, the, the second part, and this came up a little bit earlier when, when Reed was speaking, is the idea about moving quickly but not rushing. And those are, are two completely different topics. And a lot of what I think differentiates those well is uh, building out uh, TEV and B processes, testing, evaluation, validation, and verification processes that are thorough, that are robust, uh, but then don't move so slowly that it takes six months from development to actually get something fielded, uh, which is, is certainly not going to be as helpful as we'd like it to be in our environment we're in now. Um, part of that, especially when we're working with partners and allies, is building out shared testing principles too, which is slightly different than building out shared testing practices or standards. But making sure that we have enough agreement on principles that we can move forward quickly, and they can move forward quickly, that we can agree that what we're doing is proper and effective and responsible, um, but still not being exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And in that vein, uh, we have an audience question, a member of the Republic of Korea's army. They asked, what opportunities or barriers exist to AI development with allies in both the private sector and in defense partnerships? Um, a number. <laughs> I think a fundamental one is uh, the need to share data that is often privileged or classified or stored across different networks that may not be equally accessible to even different actors within the US government, let alone um, even some of our more trusted um, allies. So different approaches to data governance, different approaches to data regulation. I know in the commercial space, that's obviously an important barrier for some of the collaborative initiatives that, let's say, the United States has with some of our European allies because of their um, different approaches to regulation. So data sharing could be, of course, an important barrier. But at the same time, we also have opportunities for collaboration in AI methods and technologies that might not be as heavily reliant on data that is gathered from the real world and might have those privacy issues and concerns. There are opportunities for collaboration on simulated data or data that's been processed in a way that it doesn't have those privacy marks. So it's not an insurmountable challenge by any means, but it's one that has often been you know, a barrier. And I would actually say it's also an opportunity mm -hmm. because a lot of the data that is um, providing intelligence, like I said already, order of battle, and some of these other insights are not generated by any one military or generated by any one collection you know, entity. It's, it's out there. We don't own it. And so I think as the U.S. and our partners start to move away from this is classified, if it's not classified, it's not, if, if we didn't generate it, it's just information. 
It's what we do with it afterwards that then starts to, you know, potentially get to those uh, five eye sharing agreements or those other things. But the inf- but we can all join into the information environments where it's not classified if it wasn't, you, you know what I mean? Like I think it just sort of puts, it pivots the way we think about information. We, we always want to hold it and we feel like we own it, but if it wasn't generated by us, then I don't know that we can put, you know, markings on it um, if it's out there for the world to see. So I think it actually opens up sharing opportunities among um, different, different partners. Okay. To briefly add to what uh, Jamie said, uh, there is an extremely well integrated international research community uh, in, in, in AI more than in most other fields as well, uh, where AI researchers went open and published so much of their research, collaborate internationally so well already. So the fact that we have so many cross-country relationships already, I think does create some of the opportunities that Jamie's talking about for data, but also for basic R&D as well. Um, I have a fun question from Dr. Harlan Ullman, a senior advisor at the Atlantic Council. Um, he asked, nuclear weapons obviously had a revolutionary impact. Einstein's shorthand was E equals MC squared. What might be AI's E equals MC squared if there is one? Oh my gosh. <laughs> We're being asked to come up with a bumper sticker very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I'm not sure if this is the right audience. For that. That. <laughs> we can pass on that one. I, oh. if, if, if I can, real quick, going back to the capabilities uh, piece of it earlier, when we think about things that are revolutionary will change how uh, violence or force turns into a political outcome, which might be what, what he's getting after in the question. Um, we hit on a few things earlier, but one of them is the individualization of yeah. war and being able to target individuals already. That, that sounds a little bit science fiction when you describe it in the abstract, but then you think about what we're seeing in Ukraine already. Uh, and people don't necessarily say AI and targeting Russian generals in the same sentence, but we're certainly seeing that. Yeah. And to the extent that we keep on seeing key leaders being targeted, and we saw that with Al Qaeda mm-hmm. as well in ISIS, where um, uh, many countries were targeting specific individuals to degrade networks, to disrupt uh, military operations. I think we're gonna be able to continue seeing that, uh, especially at larger scale uh, with strategic effect. And I would say one other thing is, um, it, it won't necessarily be owned by nation states anymore, and you can't restrict that, because think of Bellingcat, right? And, and it's the collective, it's the anonymous, the, you know, it, other people can start to take sort of this power into their own hands, so a little bit of targeting individuals, but also it could be any individual that then starts to leverage it. No, that's a good point. And um, back to AI on the battlefield, uh, someone is asking how important will encryption be? Um, if an adversary bests us in encryption technology, what will the consequences be in an AI-dominated battlefield? I think we're seeing right now how important safe communications and encryptions are and the vulnerabilities that Russians have put themselves under because of their, it's hard to tell whether it's incompetence or lack of technological capabilities or the fact that uh, US and NATO and Ukrainian uh, counter encryption capabilities are Mm -hmm. exceptional, Uh, but clearly they're quite vital. So that kind of gets a little bit to the earlier point that I was making that for every dollar that you invest in autonomy and AI, you need to be investing in ways to defend and counter against autonomy and AI. What are some um, different counter technologies besides encryption that you think the US should be investing in? If I I can hit the encryption uh, question, just very briefly to build off of uh, what Rita said. It, so it's incredibly important, of course, and it's been important for quite a long time. Communicating in the open is uh, very hazardous, um, both for having people monitoring your messages and then for being able to actually pinpoint you easily, things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a traditional intelligence threat. I think what we're, uh, if we haven't started seeing it already, we're very quickly going to see, is it being able to monitor people's communications closely um, and their locations where they're transmitting from closely is also a very specific AI enable threat because if, unless it's done in some sort of deceptive fashion, that's a great way to start feeding information that can be fed through algorithms mm-hmm. or can be used to train new algorithms. Um, so going back to the data collection and management being incredibly important, 
this is a prime example of how someone not uh, being able to fight that, not being able to keep your adversary from collecting data about you is uh, a threat. Because we can just keep on making our systems to understand what uh, the Russians are doing or whoever it is we're detecting, transmitting in the open, what they're doing, more and more effective. And we can uh, keep on using it to understand where they are uh, more and more effectively as well. Thanks, Mira. Um, and a question from Stuart Johnson from the UK Ministry of Defense. Uh, how can the United States manage AI use by adversaries or entities that do not share the same values as the West, especially on the battlefield? I mean, that's the million dollar question, right? Mm -hmm. uh, to an extent, I think we are beyond efforts at management. We are at a point where we simply need to acknowledge that it's happening mm -hmm. and think about a variety of ways that increase our own capabilities, our defenses against those uses, but equally important diplomatic measures and other um, more you know, cooperative approaches that are meant to at least ensure that in certain areas we have minimal visibility or agreement or consensus that certain things are off the table. So we can talk about perhaps AI for nuclear command and control, mm -hmm. or we can talk about different aspects of autonomous weapons, completely autonomous weapons and definitions. It doesn't mean that there is going to be a prohibition on any of those tomorrow, but there's ways to you know, proceed with confidence building measures and to ensure that we can at least avoid escalation due to misunderstandings and problems with communications and visibility um, mm -hmm. in this space. It's, it's, it's like the new version of, um, uh, you know, the, the laws of, of, of war, right? How it had to keep changing as war changed. And, of course, that doesn't mean people aren't going to breach that, which we're seeing. You know, there's a lot of uh, civilians that are being targeted. That's, that's a breach against that, that particular standard or that law. But I think we're in this new era of reestablishing what are those standards, what are those kind of uh, rules of engagement that we all agree to or at least try to as best as we can, you know, do in our time. I mean, yeah, that's where we are. Yeah, the hit great points already. I, th I think the laws of armed conflict are really important for that. Not necessarily changing, though that, that could take place, but uh, the existing laws of armed conflict about discrimination, proportionality, uh, making sure that we program those into our, the AI-enabled systems we're using, uh, and then the, and setting an expectation that our adversaries will do that as well is, I think, really important. And there's a norm-setting portion of that, that that's very old uh, as well and, and helpful. Uh, and there's also kind of a deterrent element of that as well, that part of the reason that we do this is an expectation that you shall do it as well. And there's a pretty robust history of states that, um, some states, uh, that the United States has fought uh, respecting that. And the, the other, uh, I, I don't know that arms control is necessarily something I would go straight to. That's a, a really challenging topic. Okay. But there are certain areas that um, are very open for discussion there. And, and Rita hit it on, on it really well, that mm -hmm. any sort of automaticity in uh, nuclear exchange is uh, a really scary, scary idea. And it should be equally scary for every person on the planet. Uh, so I think that's a good starting point. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to go uh, switch gears and talk about China. Um, where does the U.S. stand in relation to China in terms of AI use on the battlefield? Is an audience question. Well, having gotten Russia wrong, let me <laughs> take a stab at China, I suppose. Uh, well, a fundamental point about China is that it has not been on a battlefield in a very long time, at least not in the type of a modern battlefield that the United States has been engaged in for the last 20, 30 years. So I think that's an important point to make. And as I mentioned earlier here, the differentiation between innovation and adoption and innovation and scaling is quite critical. So when we're 
assessing and reviewing Chinese capabilities, it is clear that they appear sophisticated and advanced and in certain areas very much on par, if not even ahead of US capability. Like swarming technology has been brought up as one example where the Chinese have made really interesting uh, advances. It's also critical to focus on the type of barriers they might experience for their own integration and scaling efforts, and in turn, how we could maybe, you know, augment those barriers. Mm -hmm. That's good. So agreeing very much with Rita, <laughs> one of the things that is something that we can look at uh, closely, though, is how they're being conceptualized. Uh, so uh, China pretty openly, talk, or the PLA pretty openly talks about intelligentized warfare, inform uh, informationized warfare, that I'm almost always mispronouncing, uh, and then systems destruction warfare, all of which okay. include machine learning as aspects of what they're, they're trying to do, mm -hmm. and uh, all three concepts do. Um, so they're, they're certainly working hard on making sure that they can integrate capabilities as they emerge into how they're fighting, not just developing capabilities. Um, it, it is worth noting that both countries are advancing AI capabilities, very often very similar capabilities mm -hmm. at similar paces. Um, so it doesn't seem likely that there are going to be uh, scaled, wildly different levels of AI capability between the two countries. And if one country develops it quickly, then the other country is probably close behind it. Um, and in most circumstances, though certainly not all. So that does mean if you're measuring uh, who's going to be able to have more advanced AI capabilities, a lot of what you're going to be focusing on is how AI capabilities are deployed and employed and brought into larger operational concepts. Um, like I said, China's done some interesting work there for operational concepts uh, already, and the United States is working there as well. Um, I had another interesting audience question about how could U.S. commanders use AI uh, to speed up the decision-making process on the battlefield? I think that's something that you know, people inside the Pentagon have been talking a lot about and wanting to get there. So. Well, I, the capability is there. Um, so it's not a matter of how, how could we ever solve this problem. Mm -hmm. It is there. I think it's how do we deploy back to the adoption piece. So, okay, we have this capability. We have, even DIU has pushed out prototypes that could help get that decision, um, that, that information that's critical for decision making up to those senior leaders. But our budget, we're our own worst enemy, is our budgetary cycles are, you know, you have to have planned for it five years ago when the, the technology or even the data feed wasn't around two years ago. So I, I think we're our own worst enemy on getting this deployed and getting it adapted um, to those senior leaders. But ultimately, it's okay, we, we have to respect, obviously, um, our own rules of, of how we use data, what, how are we protecting US citizens, how are we um, having the responsibility of the metrics behind it, how is this telling, how do I rely on this, so back to their trust, that, you know, okay, so now I do have this capability, is deployed, and it's in front of me, and it tells me this is the order of battle, or this is what's happening on the ground, or this is a risk, or here's some supply chain issues, now what? Do I rely on that wholeheartedly? And I think it is um, really important to always see technology, and you've, you've hit on it, as an enabler. Mm -hmm. It is not the decision. It helps to inform and enable the decision. But humans will always do what humans do best. And so we can never, nor should we ever, replace leaders' decision-making capability um, and intuition. But it's how do we feed them relevant, timely information to make those decisions and take those actions. And pulling on that bu budget process thread, um, is that something that Congress needs to help with, or is that something that DOD needs to relook at? Like, we're, yeah, how do we fix that problem? <laughs> I think all the above, actually. Uh, every, everyone has a, a, a role in the problem and the solution. I know Congress has set up a, a warfighter innovation, I believe I might be butchering it, fund, mm -hmm. which is meant to be a pot of funds that you can pull on. Um, but it's, it's just, it's hard to, get to it, it's hard to know how do we, how do we have those pots available okay. at the more um, immediate levels, the, the unit or the organizational level, rather than just at the leadership level, okay. because some of those capabilities or those needs are not communicated up in a timely fashion 
to get access to those funds. And putting in an unfunded request that doesn't get fulfilled for two years still doesn't answer that, that capability um, challenge. Okay. So as, as leaders, and you can do this at just about any level in DOD or the services, is they look at their decision-making process. They can say, this part of it has to be done by a human. This part, I can use software to scale it, where instead of making five decisions here, we can make 10,000, a million. They can optimize it uh, using optimization software, or they uh, can automate it as well and just move through it very quickly. The, the interesting thing about that is that very little of that actually requires AI. Uh, the vast majority of it requires traditional software development that doesn't bring in some of the challenges about pulling in data, about uh, responsible AI, in the same way that, that AI does. So it's, it's a much easier solution. And we could get an immense amount of improvement for just an acceleration of decision making using uh, software practices that are 20 years old. Uh, the, if we want to do that, there's a couple things that will be helpful to make sure that it moves more quickly. Um, the first one is placement of talent. If, if you concentrate talent in a centralized location, that, that's important and that's helpful. Um, but if you move talent, teams of engineers, skilled end users, much further out towards uh, the frontline units, then they can understand what problems need to be addressed, what decisions need to be accelerated at units, and then start building software-based and occasionally AI-based solutions. And then the second piece of that is being able to accelerate the authorization to operate uh, process as well. Right now, it's very often six months or even longer. It could be weeks and days. Yeah. I think we have time for one last question. Uh, can you describe any ongoing or potential efforts to mitigate the risk of AI weaponization by criminal organizations or insider threats? Are there any private industry opportunities to pursue these solutions? My gosh. Um, I think we mostly have focused on AI use by friendly powers and yes. ways to <laughs> advance it, but that's a new thing to worry about I haven't thought about. so. Well, I, I think we're seeing it um, in disinformation campaigns yeah. and influence campaigns, uh, which is probably the most obvious that we're seeing today where algorithms are weaponizing information okay. uh, and also the reliance of, okay, what is true? And, mm -hmm. and it sort of dilutes truth. Um, I would say, you know, as far as things to combat it, I know Facebook's trying to fix, fix it on their own, you know, on, and internally. Um, and then banks, obviously, financial institutions care very much about automated attacks, AI um, on the offensive being used against their networks or against their, um, their communities. And that's, you know, I think we look to where they're investing and the companies that they're starting to, to look to as, as a potential commercial outlet for that. Okay. Well, thanks for the great discussion today. Uh, we would now like to welcome Prasha Bouillon to the stage. He's the founder and CEO of Accrete AI. Uh, Prasha, over to you. Thank you very much for that introduction. And thank you to uh, the Atlantic Council for putting together this paper uh, and the event. I think it's very timely. Um, as per the panel discussion, I think we're all in agreement that we're in a new type of war. And foreign adversaries are weaponizing misinformation to attack our civil society. They are obscuring covert behavior underneath information complexity to uh, influence the supply chain. And unfortunately, the economic and geographic advantages that we've had in the past aren't going to be as effective in securing national security going forward. Um, because this new type of war takes place in cyberspace. So in order to win this war, the United States needs more than ships, missiles, and jets. The United States needs to leverage a new class of AI tools that are smart enough to continuously read through the digital universe of open source information and make sense of it in a way that can surface predictive insights humans can't in order to get ahead of these adversaries. Um, and these tools have to be explainable. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to trust them uh, and develop partnerships alongside of them. But in order to build this new arsenal of AI tools, 
The United States needs to leverage com commercial innovation where real AI has been deployed successfully. And we believe at uh, Accrete, I believe uh, personally, uh, very strongly that the speed, uh, you know, the speed with which the U.S. Uh, identifies and deploys commercial innovation in the area of artificial intelligence will determine whether or not the U.S. emerges from this new type of war victoriously. So let me tell you a little bit about our journey into the defense and intelligence world. Um, I think our journey is an exception. It's not the norm. And I think in order to win this new type of information war, our journey needs to become more of a norm, more of a standard uh, experience. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Accrete. Accrete AI delivers configurable AI applications that automate complex analytical workflows. We're based in Lower Manhattan. Uh, I founded the co-founded the company in 2017. Today we have 117 employees. We're growing very rapidly. We have four offices globally. Um, and uh, most relevant, we are in the process of completing a transition of an OTA prototype into a production license with the DOD. And the manner in which the DOD has been able to leverage our commercial innovation for government use cases needs to be scaled. And so accordingly, I think it's relevant to share our story. My background, even prior to launching Accrete, was in uh, finance, where I was creating high-frequency trading algorithms. Um, and these algorithms would simply automate order matching tasks performed by human exchange floor brokers on exchanges like the New York Stock Exchange and others. And these uh, simple algorithms were able to perform what would take humans minutes, uh, microseconds, ultimately. Over time, competitors started to come in and invest heavily in making the automation faster, spending hundreds of millions of dollars to just shave a microsecond off of tick to trade turnaround times. And, you know, it, it became clear that over time, speed was less and less of an edge. So I became very interested in, in instead of investing in speed, I wanted to try and get the machines to be able to read um, natural language from the web at scale. So it could try and understand the world in, um, more efficiently uh, and, and get closer to truth than human financial analysts that were trying to make sense of the same information, but dealing with information overload issues. Um, eventually, what happened was a very basic automation replaced human exchange floor brokers. Today, almost all trading is done through uh, um, very simple automation. And it was pretty easy to extrapolate that at some point in the future, as machines got smarter, eventually they would start to augment or even completely replace financial analysts at banks or hedge funds. And so I uh, rolled up all the previous work with my core team and we launched a new company, Accrete, in 2017 to, commer to uh, commercialize our technology and expand our underlying platform. After testing uh, very um, uh, well-marketed third-party solutions in natural language processing, what we found was most third-party solutions were static machine learning. In other words, they didn't scale because they required inordinate amounts of human instruction and labeling. And so it was not economically or practically feasible to apply such technologies to the types of data that I wanted to extract predictive insights from, um, namely open source, unstructured data that was changing rapidly. That could be social chatter, it could be news. Um, and so we focused on this area of programmatic labeling and this idea of teaching the machines how to read, understand context, and learn its scale without inordinate amounts of human instruction. For example, the types of problems that I wanted to solve was, um, with human accuracy, get a machine to correctly assess the sentiment of a sentence, like Tesla is on fire. How could the machine possibly understand whether or not that's a positive or negative statement unless it has understood or remembered the context? Is it a stock price or is it a car battery that exploded? 
And the key was to get the machine to try to accurately assess the sentiment without a human having to go in and explicitly tell the machine what the context was. So to solve that problem, we created technologies that could um, learn implicitly from sparse training data and accumulate and then transfer knowledge to adjacent domains. The benefit of deploying what we call um, uh, proven AI or AI that can understand context without explicit human instruction at scale uh, was that you could now automate very complex analytical workflows that involved um, human behavior, uh, like trying to predict uh, uh, stock market behavior or trying to predict um, whether a foreign adversary is, is, is trying to hide uh, um, their identity through information complexity. From a business perspective, static machine learning also wasn't attractive because of the inordinate expense related to labeling data and creating uh, training data sets. Um, those types of margins don't really support the types of valuations you see a lot of these um, companies that have over uh, uh, advertised AI um, because uh, it's not particularly scalable. And a lot of the demand that we have seen in the commercial space has to do with using AI to augment analytical work so you can make sense of the whole universe of unstructured data as opposed to working with very small static data sets. Um, and so uh, what we realized was that if, if, you, if the machine can learn implicitly, accumulate knowledge, and then transfer that knowledge, you could have a very profitable and scalable business. Um, which is very different than the service-oriented data analytics tools that, are, that, that we saw on the market, particularly the ones being used by the DoD. Um, so in the early days, we started to automate analytical work in finance. We would um, automate tasks of tracking merger and acquisition rumors around the web as they percolated to try and predict how they would affect stock prices. We would sell those tools to uh, top quantitative hedge funds, and then we branched out of finance. We went into areas like media and entertainment where we would create continuously learning AI knowledge graphs for um, monitoring all the chatter on platforms like TikTok and SoundCloud and Reddit to try and um, filter out bots and predict authentic engagement of audiences to predict viral musical artists. Um, and so even though we were branching out from finance into all these different industries and finding that our technology was becoming increasingly configurable and scalable. It never occurred to us that our technology would be relevant to national security. Then in 2019, we stumbled upon a request for proposal posted by the Defense Innovation Unit, in which they were seeking an AI-based knowledge graph that could continuously learn at scale to predict some sort of uh, covert human behavior pertaining to the supply chain. And, and uh, it was an epiphany for us. We said, wow, we're, we're uniquely positioned to, to uh, provide a solution here. Um, we competed against 65 firms, uh, and we won an OTA prototype contract. Uh, we uh, worked with the uh, DIU and the end customer to uh, establish an SOW, and we passed through five um, milestones in three technical areas, and the prototype was successful and accepted. And now we are in the final stages of completing a production uh, transition to an OT contract. And that is, I think, a very big deal. Um, so the bottom line is that we would never be here working to bolster national security unless it was for the DIU. And Organizations like the DIU need to be scaled and expanded from, from our perspective in order to leverage the great innovations that companies like ours are, are making through um, you know, testing technologies and ideas in the real world. So dual-use procurement initiatives are critical to identifying best-of-breed AI technologies that can be deployed on, on the both at the defense and intelligence uh, level and then in other organizations across the government as well. And then critical to the rapid identification and adoption of dual-use technologies 
we need to establish a set of standards for AI performance. What is real AI? What is not real AI? Explainability. Can you trust it? Can you trust the underlying data? Where's the data coming from? How is it being poisoned or not poisoned by an adversary? Um, what are the biases? Um, is it ethical? Is it up to the ethical standards um, that, that we set forth? And from our experience, the lack of standardization creates bottlenecks in the procurement and the acquisition process. Because I think, and a lot of people in the previous panel touched upon this, there is not a, there's a lack of understanding in terms of what is AI around nuanced topics like capacity-based pricing models or AI-based auditing um, uh, for performance and things of that nature. So these, it's almost as if you have to create a brand new template for each of these items because there's a lack of understanding that AI is fundamentally different than traditional software, even cloud-based software. Um, but our experience, I think, is a glimmer of hope because I think if you can leverage commu uh, commercial innovation through organizations like the DIU, we can help set those standards to pave a more efficient way forward. Um, so our intent in partnering with the Atlantic Council has been to highlight limitations in the adoption of dual-use technologies in AI uh, for this purpose, to help pave a more efficient path forward. And, you know, I mentioned earlier that our journey has been, um, you know, uh, an exception. It's not commonplace from the people that we speak to. Uh, and, you know, if we're going to win this new uh, type of, uh, if we're going to be victorious in this new era of conflict, it's going to be uh, critical that we accelerate acquisition pathways for non-traditional AI vendors to meet, you know, any vendor that meets or exceeds set standards uh, should be uh, rapidly adopted. And that is... Uh, uh, a little bit about our experience. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to uh, kick off our next panel, which is uh, very much focused on industry's role in the development of AI solutions and, and frankly, their incorporation into US government systems, uh, much like what Prashant was just sharing. Uh, as part of our panel, we have, uh, of course, Prashant Bouyan, who is just a speaking CEO of Accrete AI. We have Dr. Amanda Muller uh, from uh, Northrop Grumman, the responsible AI lead uh, for Northrop. Ron Keesing, correct, from Lidos, the vice president and director of their AI uh, division. And uh, Steve Escaravage, a gentleman I've known for quite some time, who is executive vice president of Booz Allen Hamilton and their artificial intelligence lead as well. So uh, <clears throat> it's not lost on me that a lot of uh, the discussion around AI tends to center on the proverbial venture back startup uh, or a uh, AFWorks uh, uh, small business innovative research grant, a SIBR, if you will. Uh, and yet what I, I found is interesting is over the last five years venture investment in dual use technology companies, many of, the, many of which we've looked at, uh, has risen from five to $15 billion. Uh, Cyber investing over the last 10 years, uh, we have spent, coll spent collectively just in DOD alone, $30 billion on Cybers. And yet in many ways, I feel like we have uh, similar Groundhog Day type conversations because often enough, uh, the discussions we have rule out or don't account for the major system integrators, of which, of course, you three r represent. Um, they don't account for uh, mundane things like authority to operate, you know, moving through an OT production contract. So uh, as part of this discussion, I'd like to first off uh, start with you, Prashant. And can you spell out a little bit more uh, as CEO of a company entering this space, what would you have liked to have seen more of? Or, and, and certainly looking forward now, what do you, what do you want to see more of, uh, both from the government, but also your key industry partners? As you point would be more standardization. I think it would be nice to have a framework of how to 
sell AI to the government. Um, but understanding that it's a new area altogether um, and considering the panel, I actually think it would be very useful to have had introductions to integrators early on who we could work with to integrate our technologies as partners to accelerate the procurement and the acquisition process. Uh, Amanda, from your perspective, we talk a lot about what AI can do. Uh, in uh, rare cases, we talk about what it actually can't do, uh, which is usually a decisively technical discussion. Um, from your perspective, though, um, <clears throat> when we talk about responsible AI, what is it? And what is it, uh, or I should say, how does it inform a discussion like this, which in inevitably is very aspirational, right? We see an incredible AI technology and talk about all the possibilities and how it could you know, make uh, a number of things great again. Uh, but how should we think about responsible AI, uh, both the listeners to this uh, discussion, and especially when we talk about new companies coming in from the commercial sector that may have no government ownership, and by that I mean no outside non-dilutive federal funding. Um, how do we think about responsible AI in that situation? Yeah, it, in Northrop Grumman, we're thinking about responsible AI as a three-faceted problem. So it's the policy, it's the technology, and it's the governance that, mm -hmm. that brings those together. So from a policy perspective, policy is coming to us from the government. You know, we are a, a primarily a government contractor, so we look to the government to mm. provide us that guidance on, on policy. But then we need to translate that. You know, what does that mean for us as, as we get the Department of Defense's five ethical principles of AI? What does that mean for our employees and how can they implement those policies? So we have put together a working group that includes representatives from legal policy uh, governance, technology, strategy, business development, because all of those are facets of responsible AI. We need to be able to understand how to interpret those requirements that are coming from the government. So that, you know, that's a, a legal and a compliance issue. We need to understand where the risk comes in when we are developing AI systems in use cases that have never been done before, when we're developing technology that's never been used before in a battlefield situation. What happens when something goes wrong? What happens if we get bad data, if the data is poisoned? Who has responsibility for that? We need to account for that in the development of our AI systems. It's also a business development challenge. And we need to work very closely with our customers as the land development challenge. And we need to work very closely with our customers as the landscape of AI changes, as we're applying AI to new use cases to understand what it means to operate responsibly within those use cases from the customer's perspective. And then it is also a technology challenge. So we, t we get that policy that we use that to guide the development of our technology. And technology is not just the algorithms or the software. Um, it is also the hardware on which the AI operates. When we are building systems for applications like Joint All Domain Command and Control or for any type of battlefield situation, we need to be operating at the tactical edge. So if the hardware is vulnerable, mm then the AI isn't going to be trustworthy. We're not going to be able to operate in that situation. And you can expand that out also to the networks that are bringing our information in and out, um, that are passing information or data back and forth. Those also need to be secure and robust and reliable. So responsible AI encompasses all of that technology. And then bringing things together is the governance. So we need to have robust AI governance in order to make sure that we are responsible. And we've partnered with a Silicon Valley company, Credo AI, um, to provide us with guidance on implementing governance. They have done a lot of work in the commercial space, so we're leveraging that. But then we, as a large system integrator, are bringing that mission knowledge and the understanding of how to work with the government and what is important within these defense spaces. So those are the three facets. And I would be remiss if I also didn't talk about why we're doing all of this. You know, we are doing responsible AI so that AI works for our warfighters. So when we're developing AI systems and we want to ensure that they're responsible, we need to make sure that human systems integration is part of that equation, that user experience is part of that equation. So we need to employ people with, with this expertise, you know, whether that comes from inside the system integrator or from a small company, we need human systems integration, human factors engineering, user experience to have a seat at the table and a place on the Scrum team. Uh, 
I'm chuckling because I just wrote human factors as a note to follow up on. Um, <clears throat> Ron, uh, from your perspective, uh, Lidos d deals uh, extensively with the U.S. government uh, across a variety of types of contracts, uh, not just in the, the development and the, the enablement, or you could say realization of artificial intelligence, but also in many cases the, the training and the sustainment of that as well, ensuring that you know, the people who end up with this software in, you know, create software, dare I say, in their hands, uh, actually know what to do with it. And then, of course, the ladies and gentlemen, the soldiers, uh, sailors, airmen, airmen and Marines who follow them, right, because the military turns over, also know how to use it. So from your perspective, what, uh, what does integration look like with <clears throat> uh, a major uh, system integrator or, or a major service provider like Elidos um, with its U.S. government customers, and how do you help them understand when they see, you know, they see Prashant on stage somewhere, or they they read a, God forbid, a tweet from Elon Musk, and they say, you know what, we could use that in fill in the blank command. Like that, inevitably, is going to end up on one of your desks. For, so, from your perspective, how do you help educate government customers on what they should expect from a AI solution? Well, it's a, it's a great question, and um, you know, having first of all, um, I would say uh, I think I have the most fun like AI job in the world because we have to work on such an interesting range of missions, right? Everything from you know securing DISA's networks from the, the GSMO contract to supporting the supply chain for the International Space Station mm -hmm. to running the nation's air traffic control systems to providing healthcare to you know all our war fighters, and so. Um, you know, all of these are these incredibly data-rich jobs, and it's a it's a wonderful opportunity to apply AI in that space. With that said, we've seen across uh, attempts to implement AI across government um, a series of of repeated challenges, and we often get called in for programs. When people have tried AI, and it really isn't working out for them. Um, so we have a lot of experience in seeing where AI often falls short when mm. we when we kind of just uh, do that haphazard introduction, right? Um, Two real points come up again and again. The first is a failure to actually realize the envisioned value, usually because the value hasn't really been thought through in advance. Um, the second point that's really critical is um, there haven't been the right uh, steps taken to actually effectively establish trust in AI. Um, and we see this again and again, because if system owners don't trust it, if <coughs> users don't trust it, um, the AI just never gets turned on, right? So it never gets out of the laboratory mm. and into a production environment where it can actually add value. Um, one of the things that we've used as a, as a tool to help introduce this, first of all, is, is the concept that uh, effective trusted AI involves a combination of technology components, and we develop those, and we also take best mm. technology from the commercial market sure. um, to do that, and open source tools. But the second part is really a methodology, a thoughtful methodology mm. for the introduction of AI in ways that engender trust. Um, mm. We do this, you know, not, you know, the, the typically it doesn't work to introduce AI as kind of a fully automated or fully autonomous solution on right. day one, right? Yep. Um, what we find is it actually is very helpful to start by kind of an analysis phase where we focus on what the data and what the data mm. tells us. Then we move to often an assistive phase where we're helping humans do things they could do before, mm. but do them more easily. And that stage is really important because we're often gathering feedback from human users that provides data we didn't actually have when we started that helps design in kind of human knowledge into those systems until you get to an augmented stage where maybe we're allowing humans <coughs> to now do tasks they really couldn't do before without the assistance of AI until in some cases you actually are developing kind of fully autonomous or fully automated capabilities. Sure. One of the, you know, there are a lot of uh, valuable lessons we've learned in applying this methodology, one of which is that often the kind of highest point of ROI, the point where you're value, generating the most value, is not to get to all the way around that system, which is also where you're operating typically at the mm. highest level of risk, right? Mm. And it is the hardest to establish that trust. So by walking through, you develop trust organically, mm. but you also realize when you should stop. Um, we've had some great examples for, you know, where we've reached, say, a point of assistance, and we've realized that at that point of just assisting humans to look at less data, we've already realized 95% of the possible value mm. that AI could add. And trying to get to, let's say, a fully automated or autonomous solution would be a lot harder. It would be enormously costly to do so, enormous trust barriers to overcome, enormous kind of responsible AI ethics mm. and um, you know, responsible AI issues to overcome to allow the AI to run without human 
assistance. Mm. But there's not even any value there anyway. You've got 95% just by helping the human not look at a bunch of things they had to look at before. Right. So we see this kind of pattern again and again uh, when we look at kind of how we apply AI effectively on these really massive data-centric jobs for the US mm. government. That's fascinating. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I, uh, I joined and worked at a venture-backed tech startup that that sold, uh, unfortunately, about five years before AI was cool again <laughs> from our valuation perspective. Um, <clears throat> I also know a lot of surprisingly major tech companies that have entered uh, the US government market. And frankly, they serve as almost a cautionary tale, especially the first wave of these companies uh, in terms of integrating their business model. And this is directed towards Steve, integrated their business model uh, uh, with what's required to actually ensure success in a, a government customer environment. What both of you were talking about, uh, Ron and Amanda, you know, is I think spot on. And yet the, what I kept thinking, I was like, I kept thinking, man, like these companies, I know how they sell their products, which is as a SaaS or a deploy, deployable solution. And of course, what you guys were talking about correctly is, well, actually there's a lot more manual kind of service oriented labor, right? which is great news for, for us working in the federal space where we, we're, our business models are built to accommodate that. Unfortunately, major tech companies of choice, their business models are not in any way set up to put ladies and gentlemen on site indefinitely solving customer problems, right? Their goal is to put the software on site and walk away and collect their invoice net 30. Uh, so Steve, from your perspective, uh, Booz uh, owns uh, a shocking number of AI uh, contracts as, as well as the Joint AI Center uh, management contract. Uh, from your perspective, looking instead of looking towards the government, looking out towards those commercial new entrants, what do you typically see uh, from them and what do you need to educate them on in order to be successful and have a, a remote chance, not just to getting that first contract, right? but ensuring that they continue to get those out your contracts and actually sustain themselves in the government space. Yeah, fair, fair point. I think that too often, the first time we meet is when we have a 30-day deadline to integrate a capability, mm. and that's the first time we've come together in innovation corridor company mm. and an integrator, and now we're against the clock. And it's mm. usually for some important exercise or field experiment, and you know we're working against time. Three things jump out. And I've seen this across so many different examples. One is, uh, General Groen mentioned this, this key timeline of 2025 to 2030. Unfortunately, we're not gonna have a drastic cutover in all of the environments that we use in the defense and national security space. And so working together for the non-traditional companies and the traditional companies to understand what are the engineering environments that we have today and working to engineer into those, not just into some idealized state of what we could bring to bear in the commercial sector, which we all want to get there. We're not going to be able to get there fast enough to only build to that environment. We have mm. to look at the interim and drive adoption right now so that we have this, we build this trust, we build momentum. And I think that we've got to work that both ways and really understand if there's some dependency uh, for example, that Accrete needs, then we've got to work to figure out how to bring that to bear in the network. So that's, mm -hmm. that's one. The second thing, I, I have yet to see this, but I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it, and I hope I see it after this, this talk, is um, we see these amazing demos, and we go, this solves technical debt that we have in a mission in today where we're serving as the integrator. Mm. We know how to, we, we've seen the proof of concept, but can we really maintain this? in the environments that we work in. What happens if we have to deploy into a production network environment that's highly classified mm. and all of the development environments are unclassified <clears throat> and we can't pass back, uh, you know, sort of class prediction errors or other types of exhaust that we throw off from the model in production because mm. we don't know the classification of that. So how, how, how do you work through that? And so that whole calibration and how will you maintain this? Like o and is not the most exciting part of any sort of modernization, new technology deployment. Mm -hmm. It is so critical. And the thing that I worry about quite frequently is, I know that we can get into production. Can we maintain this? And can we mm -hmm. take it long term? And then the third part of that too is, 
how do we get to a good place so that um, these incredible innovators can bring their technology and have faith that the, the derivative IP that's created mm. is protected through their time and investments, but that also the, the DOD and the, and the intelligence community enterprise can incentivize continue investment in that capability mm. so that it's not just we're going to fork the code as soon as we deploy and we're going to go in a different direction. That doesn't solve the problem for anybody, if mm. that makes sense. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and feel free to jump in as we continue to go through this discussion. Uh, Steve, as a follow-up, uh, <clears throat> when we think about O&M and we think about technologies uh, that <clears throat> AI, which I think we talked about in our, in our preparatory call, is an impossibly broad ontology, uh, which is probably an issue in and of itself. Yeah. Um, a lot of the stuff that we have right now, the hardware, uh, was uh, you know built decades ago. Now it's absolutely been upgraded in many cases, but in many cases the hardware and the software have not. So would love to get uh, you know you know any of your responses on how uh, emergent AI solutions right today 2022 can be almost rever reverse engineered into legacy hardware and software solutions, which is in some ways much more difficult. Uh, I, I, uh, a couple of years ago, I heard an interesting quote related to the innovation ecosystem, which is that of the 200 MDAPs, right, major defense programs out there, uh, roughly 150 are uh, legacy sustainment programs, which really opened my eyes personally, because I, 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 you, know, you think you know, if you just you know, read what comes out in the headlines, you think that like, the only thing out there being funded or of interest at all is the latest, you know, thing, right, that's on the marketing brochures of the, yeah. you know, tech companies or defense contractors, when in fact there's a huge component of the budget that's precisely trying to just keep the stuff we already have on station and on mission. So uh, would love to get the, the panel as a whole's thoughts on how, uh, uh, you, in your respective roles, how you can uh, integrate those you know, new technologies, whether it be a creed or others, uh, that come in and show up on your doorstep. Yeah, well, I'm happy to start. I think Amanda mentioned tactical edge. I mean, these are real challenges where we don't have all of the robust computing and networking storage that mm -hmm. we want. And there's solutions that are coming out of the commercial space that are layers in this sort of AI technology stack that are needed and just very candidly, we were running into trouble replicating some of the success in our beefy computing labs that we need to replicate those models running at the edge. And uh, we went out and made an investment in a company, Layton AI, to solve that problem for us because yeah. they have a specific approach for compressing, optimizing, and packaging models for deployment at the edge. And they solved our latency and swap issues. Wow. Yeah, I would just note, uh, I, I agree, you know, Stephen, we've seen a lot of progress in the commercial world from this, and also <coughs> from you know, some, of the, some of the hardware makers as well. So we've yeah. been partnering strongly with Intel and NVIDIA on tools for actually optimizing performance uh, at the tactical edge. But I think an important point too is, um, you know, often we're even dealing with situations where there, there isn't, um, you know, we're talking about hardware that can be generations old, right, in embedded systems. Um, so we end up definitely having, in some cases, to come up with, with even more dramatically simplified models than most AI companies would typically, uh, most of the, the edge computing companies would typically think of. Yeah. Um, so I would say uh, we have found, you know, as we take kind of the, the commercial packaging uh, and optimization for kind of AI-centric chipsets as far as we can go, um, we have had uh, definitely a lot of edge use cases. We've really had to get down into bare metal coding <laughs> right. um, in, and very stripped down AI models in order to build something that can work with a legacy system. So um, again, that comes to that you know, system integrator yeah. experience, right? That in fact, it sounds great to have some very highly performant algorithm, um, but if you're not thinking about you know, the swap that you put in an avionics package um, on a legacy aircraft that's 30, 40 years old, mm. um, you're not really helping anybody. Mm. Interesting. Amanda, uh, as a follow-up, uh, when we think about engaging the tech ecosystem, there have been a couple of recent high-profile cases. I won't even mention them because the, the, the companies that, they, that, that are rep representative have sworn up and down that they are fully supportive of American national security now. Uh, <clears throat> having said that, do you think that 
uh, focusing on, we'll just say, cut out the buzzwords and just say good governance when it comes to AI. Uh, do you think in doing that, uh, in, in actually getting people to understand and take that responsible AI, you know, good governance seriously, would actually help narrow and, and better educate people on what AI actually is and what it can do and, 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 and potentially also serve as a guiding light for maybe some recalcitrant tech bros uh, who are all about, you know, you know, ensuring that your food's delivered on time, but, you know, are uninterested in countering, you know, you know, threats from overseas. I think you touched on a couple of points there. One is that AI and defense both have an image problem. Hmm. And, and that's not something that we are going to solve here today. It's not something that we're, <laughs> we are ever going to solve. It's going to require a, a lot of smart people to, to tackle that and to, to build that understanding that, um, that AI ethics and defense <coughs> is not an oxymoron. This, this is something that we can, a, we can accomplish. And part yeah. of doing that is, is a common lexicon, a common yeah. understanding of what it means to do AI, what it means to do AI in defense, and what it means to do AI ethically in defense. And it is different to do ethical AI in defense than it is in the commercial world. We have different challenges and different responsibilities when we're operating in the defense space. Mm. So I think we need to be very clear in talking about that and saying, here's what it means to be ethical in defense. Here are the things that we will do with AI, and here are the things that we will not do with AI. And, and being very clear and upfront about that. Um, and. And this is something that I think is a challenge that uh, was brought up in the National Security Commission on an AI report. Mm. Um, and it's something that has been talked about within our own company about, you know, how do we build that, that, um, that trust with the general public and with tech companies that it, it is mm. possible to do AI responsibly within the defense industry. Mm. Interesting. Uh, Prashant, from your perspective, what... Uh, what barriers has, uh, <clears throat> you, know, you talked earlier about the successes that you guys have had. What, what are some of the things you've learned and what are some of the barriers that you have o had to overcome, particularly ones I think we'd all be interested in, the ones that you didn't really see coming, right? The ones that showed up on an email or in a call or in a meeting and you're sitting there scratching your head saying, Boy, I didn't even know this was a thing. Uh, I think just um, as kind of an outsider coming into defense and intelligence, uh, I saw a push and pull between, especially considering we came in through the DIU, a push and pull in terms of cultures, which I thought was something that was unexpected. Mm. Um, and I think that a lot of that touches upon some of what you've been talking about, particularly around, um, you know, what is AI, what is not AI? And, and from my, our perspective, if it's not learning and predicting something useful and explaining, particularly from unstructured data like language, then it's not AI, you know. Um, and so, you know, people buy AI to replace or augment human work, you know what I mean, to get scale, get that leverage. Mm -hmm. That's our definition of it. So our focus areas are on, if we're building a knowledge graph, the knowledge graph should populate itself. It should be able to extract entities mm -hmm. from lots of data, uh, map them together, normalize them, and it should be do, able to do it at scale. And what we found was there's tremendous support for, for that and, and tremendous understanding, like sophisticated mm. understanding with the people in government of what, I mean, there's so many smart people, you know, what AI needs to be. But then there's this culture clash where, okay, well now how do we, you know, push it live and things like that. And a lot of those people aren't involved in the definitional process. And so it seems to be very fragmented the whole, you know, transition process into, into production, which is, which is a cultural thing, I think. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that that is a unique challenge of the defense industry are, are those dividing lines between acquisition and operations. And breaking that, down those dividing lines is going to be really important to make sure that we can operate AI responsibly, to make sure that we are building something that works for the warfighters, to make sure that we understand what the operational end needs are and that there is not that, you know, we're working with the acquisition authority right now and then we're going to deploy it and now it's in mm -hmm. operations. 
You know, when, when we're building AI and AI is bringing in new information, it's changing, it's evolving as it's in the operational environment, you know, we, we can't have that, that division where, you know, there is no continuous integration, continuous delivery when you have that dividing line there. So I, I agree that's definitely a cultural challenge that we need to address in order to, to leverage these new technologies. And I think breaking down um, some of those processes, um, standardization, can help with that, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. if different communities get together, integrators, you know, tech companies, government, they get together and they agree on a set of standards. What is AI? Maybe there are different levels of AI, like self-driving cars have different levels, you know, um, you know, maybe these things can be resolved. Yeah, I, I will say though, there are some deep challenges that mm -hmm. remain here. Um, you know, you mentioned Amanda, you know, the, the difference between traditional DOD acquisitions where you go through you know, a, a requirements phase and you're able to define exactly what you want and then you build it and then you test it and then you deploy it mm. and it stays that way forever. I mean, AI doesn't work that way. Right. Um, we all know this uh, and yet we try, you know, we have to kind of figure out how to live with an ecosystem that's tuned for that. And, and even more troubling is the fact that um, we as a community, none of us really know how to do thorough test and evaluation or you know, V&V &V on, let's say, a, a modern transformer NLP model. I mean, we do certain kinds of testing, don't get me wrong, but the complexity of a model with hundreds of billions of parameters is beyond our capacities to test mm. today. Um, now, that doesn't mean we can't use them and it doesn't mean we can't figure out how we can safely use them in environments, mm. but it does entirely break the assurance paradigms that we have and even after, if we could do it once, we still have this problem that assurance is gonna to have to be continual on these systems. So all these are kind of, uh, to me, major unresolved challenges. We all need to work together as a community. Yep, Steve, you, you mentioned uh, uh, good enough for the operational environment, or as henceforth, I, I'll coin the, the Goldilocks principle for AI and DoD. Uh, yeah. What does that mean and, and how do we get the software, I mean, uh, the apps on our phones update every two weeks, right? Yeah. Uh, how do we, I'm not saying everything that we're operating in, in an operational environment needs to update every two weeks, but I'll, I'll take less than every two decades. Uh, so what does good enough for an operational environment look like? And, and, and feel free you and then anyone else uh, talk about how do we actually get there in, in practice? Yeah, I, I like to think of, um one, one quick comment. I think that back to the governance piece, with cyber and with web-enabled technologies, everything, we had to retrofit governance into the process. I think we are at a unique time in AI where it's already proliferated, but we can still put our arms around some of the components. Where we're integrating large transformer models, that requires sophistication now where we kind of still can put our arms around that. We probably should. That's just one final comment there. And then mm. I like to think for the good enough piece in two stages. One is, can we, can we build a capability and integrate it in a way where it can learn in the real world operational environment and mm. almost learn in a do no harm way? Learn, instrument the processes, um, have real users hitting the system, and maybe that reduces some additional costs because there's some redundancy and almost, you know, we're kind of building confidence over time. And then, I agree with you, Ron, I think that a lot of work needs to be done is what is operationally relevant and what is operationally good enough. But we've seen, at least in some of the efforts we've had, it takes some time to get a, a system learning in the real world operational environment. There's always context, always dynamics that we could not replicate in the test environment. Mm. And then there always comes a point in time where it seems it is not good enough to deploy because most of the expert judgment approaches that are used today are actually quite good. But you know when you've started to push a threshold and it's become pretty obvious to us, mm. what would be helpful is we always wonder, <coughs> are we waiting too long to kind of flip the switch? Mm. And is it good enough now? And how do we tell the story to all of the stakeholders from tactical operators to more strategic business leaders mm. who are very concerned about operational risk around these technologies? But it's the kind of two steps, do no harm, and then, wow, it's working, let's use it at scale. Mm. One of the things we're doing in the commercial sector is you know, we're benchmarking our tools against the human counterparts that are performing the job. The machines will have the bias 
um, in performance, et cetera, but so will the humans. Yeah. So if we can establish some sort of you know, contractual understanding with the customer that you know, this, is, this is the bias uh, in, in the performance of the human, you know, and this is the AI, then you can mitigate, you know, thorny issues like edge cases and things like that yeah. that can kill projects because, you know, somebody tests something one time and, and that one thing is an error and then all of a sudden they say this thing isn't deployable. That's right. I, I will say it's been our experience, uh, you know, I, first of all, I agree very much. It's been our experience that it, even if you can outperform the human process on day one, um, it's often valuable with intention to have humans interact with the AI at first. Um, just to give sure. you an example, we're doing this on a on a healthcare application right now, where we've got a we, we've determined already a process. The machines can outperform humans out of the box, but frankly, I know from experience that if we try and deploy it that way, the machine will make mistakes and it'll get turned off. Right. Mm. Um, so we're actually you know with intention introducing the AI to the you know and having AI and humans work together at first, so we can eliminate even more errors and we can incorporate their judgment and their knowledge into the process because. You know, the numbers are, are great, but in my experience, people judge the human errors and the machine errors so differently mm -hmm. that it can be very, you know, very challenging to kind of, mm -hmm. even if people sign up to that contract to begin, mm -hmm. um, the machine mis errors systematically get overweighted. And mm -hmm. so that's part of the reason that, you know, having humans build that trust organically can be so important in mm -hmm. successful AI introduction. Yeah. That's a great point. Yeah, and I, I would take it beyond having them work with the AI at first to continuing to have them work yeah. with the AI and continuing to test. I think you said, you know, making sure that we are testing with the human users, hmm. you know, not just testing the algorithm by itself, but testing it in the context of the broader system that involves the human users in whichever way the humans are using the system. And I keep saying users, but I'm trying to change my own terminology from users to teammates. Because I think it is so important that we build AI in a way that can effectively team with human beings. Mm -hmm. you know, not just be something that we throw over the fence to a set of users and expect them to be able to operate, but we need to include them within the development process and create a true teammate relationship between humans and AI. So our vision at Accrete really is to achieve a state of natural interaction between the user and the machine, yeah. mm -hmm. where the machine learns implicitly in a way that feels effortless for the user. Because it's when you know, it's kind of like a child learns, you know, uh, effortlessly. It's mm -hmm. when you have, to, when it becomes a pain point, that's when the user checks out. And so that's really w one of our goals as well. Interesting. So l let me ask a follow-up question. Uh, it almost seems like you, your, your commentary around a uh, methodology of trust, around AI utilization and responsible governance or responsible AI uh, are almost synergistic. And, and talk to me more about your, your thoughts on that and how, from a training perspective and, 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 and really an enduring utilization perspective, right? The thing that's killed many uh, <laughs> so shocking, shockingly large defense contracts is just turnover of staff, right? Especially on the military side, right? These men and women get new assignments every two years, they move on and all of a sudden, it's not even the, the chief bill payer, it's the chief, your chief advocate in that office is gone. And now you have a new person, maybe you have new users roll in. And in some ways, I've, uh, and this is for, for your commentary, uh, I feel like the rollout of the third offset strategy 300 years ago, I mean, seven years ago, uh, <clears throat> was really a big missed opportunity to, uh, for DOD to actually wrap their arms around and enfranchise the heritage defense industrial base. Because if you remember back then, um, it was put out there that, you know what, what we're doing, that we're falling behind the Chinese and the Russians and everyone else. What we're doing right now is not good enough. Our technology sucks. People are stupid. And what we really need is to go out and get, the, get all the cool new stuff that the rest of the country is doing and bring it in. When in fact, what I'm hearing live from you guys is no matter what kind of tech you bring in, there's still a lot of even if you don't want there to be manual handholding and training and servicing and all that, there's an element of trust building that has to occur as well. Agree, disagree, any thoughts on that? Uh, I mean, I, I, again, I couldn't agree more strongly. And I'd also say, you know, you, you made this link between kind of a, this methodology or, you know, kind of systematic building of trust and mm -hmm. the governance piece, which I think is, is such a great point. Um, one of the reasons that we do it the way we do is that, um, Getting governance, you know, governance has to be baked in from the beginning, but it's hard to get right. 
Um, and if you try and jump to, you know, here's my most sophisticated AI solution I'm going to build out of the box, and I'm going to think through all the governance and all the pieces that have to be there, and I'm going to get it right mm. on day one. That's really hard to do. Mm. Um, typically, you know, a good governance process, I and mean, we have a, a team a lot like yours um, internally, it takes some learning and some experience to build a good governance function around each AI application. Mm. So one of the other um, things we find is that you know this kind of gradual introduction allows you to be continually managing risk because we focus very much on a, a risk uh, scored ethical AI approach. What are the risks? How do we mitigate them continuously across mm. the life cycle? And by being thoughtful about the way we introduce mm. AI, we can really keep risk continuously managed as we understand the larger risks that occur at kind of higher levels of AI capability. So that's been a really valuable lesson for us. You know, one, one thing, we, we've seen it work both sides. I think I agree that typically what we try to avoid is the case where one failure mode results in the complete loss of trust, even though we've built up so much <laughs> confidence and right. we're performing so much higher than the traditional process was. We've seen it in the other dimension as well, though, too, where we've built a system, deployed it to operations, and then to continue to monitor the system, continue to calibrate it, we introduced false positives and false negatives. And what we found in those cases, this was a, a fraud investigation use case, was mm. all of the cases that we advanced purposely as false positives, that mm. if the human were to look at them, which was the process still then, it looked completely like green. There's no risk at all in this. And we wanted them to say mm. the algorithm is misperforming here. It's not performing. This is a false classification. They advanced all 100% of them because they built too much trust mm -hmm. in the system. And that's the delicate balance between this. It's almost that, a human factors challenge, isn't it? It, it, it really is. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and that's why I think, you know, it's so important that humans get to interact with AI throughout the process. Because the truth is, our algorithms are going to make mistakes. I mean, you think about human experience with self-driving cars, right? We all know contexts in which I'm comfortable to let the, the machine take the wheel. Maybe it's, you know, if I've got a car car capable of, let's say, parallel parking or whatever. Um, but if I'm driving on a country road on a stormy night, I'm not going to let my Tesla, you know, <laughs> okay. take control of That's my right. car, right? Um, and we've had those experiences at varying levels so that we kind of understand the context in which we can trust. Because overtrust, as you point out, can be a key issue as well. And so when we say trust, you know, it's important we recognize trust has to be properly calibrated and calibrated by teaching humans how to be teammates to AI and the AI how to be a teammate to the human. Exactly, yeah, and having that understanding of what the human reaction is going to be to mm -hmm. the AI and, and continuing to monitor that and adjust as necessary. We can't expect the human to always be the one to adapt and, mm -hmm. and to, you know, telling them, hey, you're making mistakes here, you need to do a better job is probably not going to, to have the outcome that we want. So <laughs> we need to make sure that we build mm -hmm. that into our AI systems and that's gonna require continuous in a integration with the human teammate, not just with the AI software. Mm -hmm. I also think domain experts need to create some sort of shared knowledge base um, of performance metrics that take into account the consequence of an error. Mm -hmm. right. Because there are different types of tasks that have different levels of consequence. If we're trying to predict the next musical artist or something, that's a little different than you know, should we do surgery on this part of the body or whatever? So, yeah, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, there really is a uh, high risk, low return uh, calculus when it comes to integrating new technology, especially new AI. To your point, you know, violating the uh, Hippocratic Oath, right? If you know, you know, if you if you do no harm, and often this has been a critique applied towards American military operations overseas, right? Like the bad guys can you know, do whatever they want with us or their civilian population and get away with it scot-free, we have the quintessential strategic corporal, right? The corporal yeah. that, you know, loses his or her cool and shoots some unarmed civilians and it's on, you know, the major news networks for the next week. I feel like there is almost a similar uh, challenge when deploying AI software in the military environments, especially of increasingly uh, increasing consequence as well. Uh, Maybe a follow-up question then is, are there lower risk missions, right, that don't involve a squadron of, of F-22s, you know, uh, you know, deciding on their own whether or not to strike a, an, an enemy combatant? Uh, is, what, what, what's the rubric? Where should the rubric be, maybe, Amanda? And then what are some more crucial but also maybe mundane 
tasks where artificial intelligence solutions can make a decisive difference. You know, f uh, the first one that comes to mind is anything that solves the defense travel service uh, <laughs> would be uh, uh, manna from heaven from my perspective. <laughs> Um, so the short answer to your question is yes, there are lower risk use cases. Um, the longer answer is that it depends. Um, and I, I think I, I want to answer this in terms of there's not one answer, but it's a process. So we need governance to be part of the process. We need to understand the risk profile, as you mentioned earlier. Um, and that's going to be different for every particular use case. So it, we start with an understanding of what is the use case that we're trying to solve with an AI solution. And maybe AI, AI isn't the right solution. Maybe AI is too high risk in that particular use case and we should use something else. Um, but then we need to have that governance process in place where we evaluate what is the trustworthiness of our data? Is there risk introduced because mm. you know, we, we don't have the provenance for our data or we can't particularly trust you know, some, some piece of our data or it's subject to adversarial attack? What is the confidence we have that our AI is secure mm. um, and that it's, it's not being attacked while it's in operations? Um, mm. What is the confidence we have that we have the right set of data and, and the right use cases? And you know, all of that goes together to create this <coughs> risk profile to say, you know, are, are we willing to put this into operations or not? Mm. Yeah, I was just going to note, you know, it was really interesting you, you, you raised that issue of, you know, how we judge consequence and what standard we want to hold sure. AI to in the right missions. Because often when we have these discussions, especially around areas like AI ethics, mm -hmm. The discussion, especially the public wants to have, is this envisioned Terminator application that um, DOD is building these killer robots that mm -hmm. are going out there, and that that's going to be really, you know, the high consequence military application sure. and the most immediate one sure. we're going to build. You know, whereas what we find is, you know, we're getting the most traction applying AI across, you know, these huge network operation problems where DOD's bogged down and spending enormous amounts of money and human resources just trying to keep networks operating. And if we can just automate the finding of root causes, you know, you can free up, you know, soldiers to actually be out there on the battlefield doing good mm. as opposed to, um, you know, spending their time configuring a bunch of devices or trying to figure out how to, you know, absorb these massive quantities of data to even get an answer. Um, now, with that said, I also note, um, I think it's important that we, we help to shift the conversation a bit around AI ethics. Um, because all the ethical discussions tend to focus around how do we prevent ourselves from building the Terminator, and we tend to then come up with this kind of prescriptive moral formulation around AI ethics of right. how do we keep AI from being this evil thing, yeah, right? Yeah, do no um, evil, yep. Exactly, and the truth is, I, I think sometimes that conversation shifts us away from realizing the mm -hmm. opportunities that AI has to achieve really positive outcomes. Mm -hmm. I mean, the most powerful military battlefield applications of AI historically have been in increasing situational awareness, right? And we tend to think about, oh my gosh, I can't tell you how many times I've been asked, what happens if the AI mistakes a school bus for a tank? Well, that would be terrible, but it isn't like school buses don't get mistaken for tanks in current war fighting, right? And so we, it, even though I've argued that you know, machine errors do get overweighted and that will always be true, it's still important that we keep in mind there are real baselines for how well we do these things. And that mm. AI that can help reduce the fog of war, which is still very real, um, is, you know, that's the most powerful battlefield application to me of AI, and it will be for some time, mm. is reducing the fog of war. And I think that's something where AI can actually help us achieve very virtuous outcomes. Mm. Reduce risk to our war fighters, keep them out of harm's way, and reduce collateral damage too. And I think it's important that we help shift this conversation around we're not building killer robots to we're actually deploying AI that's going to make better outcomes happen in war, which is inherently a very dangerous place where bad things happen today. Yeah, this is a pretty frequent debate from about 10 p.m. till 3 o'clock in the morning in computing labs around the, around <laughs> the area is, you know, is there an area and someone will, you'll say supply chain and logistics and someone will give you an example where grease or bolts didn't get somewhere when they needed to and it resulted in a mission failure. Or uh, they'll talk about, well, maybe collection management for ISR assets and then that one additional requirement that came in meant that we didn't get a chance to collect somewhere else. Training, optimization of training through AI methods, which mm. uh, Justin Lynch had mentioned earlier, sure. is one area that seems safe, <laughs> where people say, okay, maybe this is an area, and it, it goes hand in hand, um, where maybe we're, we'd be willing to lean a little bit forward there, and maybe a little mm. bit less explainability 
if the algorithms predicted this training curriculum or these sets of scenarios for training, mm. maybe, and I'm sure there's, you know, hopefully not folks out there from the training disciplines who will send me nasty emails tomorrow saying, no, 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 if you miss this one training course of action and, yep. and you don't have enough run throughs, it results in mission degradation. I think the reality is all these, this is what is different about defense and national security missions. Mm. They're all high stakes. Mm -hmm. And so I know that from the outside in sometimes, there's a lot of criticism of the processes are slow and the requirements are so heavy and the standards are so high, but it's, it's because all of the missions are high stakes and it's hard even in those hours between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. Mm. to win an argument to say, well, there's one that we can be a little bit more loose. Mm. But Sean, it almost seems like it's a, a cognitive, uh, a, a human cognitive or perception challenge when it comes to military applications. Partly, I think, because of the risk reward that you guys have articulated. I think partly also just the way it's presented. And I often think uh, uh, about my uh, my Instagram feed. Um, <clears throat> I won't share my hashtag with you guys. Uh, uh, but it's amazing how you start. I mean, you know, the infinite scroll, right? You're just thumbing through it, and it's just keep, it's feeding all the, it's just tracking what you're looking at, right? So for me, it's like funny cat videos and <laughs> Liverpool soccer highlights. <laughs> and it's amazing. It's like a fire hose. It just keeps serving those up uh, ad infinitum. So it, is there a way that uh, tech companies uh, can present, having heard kind of what they've said, is there a way that you and other tech companies can or should present your solutions, right? Because the government doesn't buy technology and they, they don't buy capabilities, they buy solutions. Uh, is there a way to present those solutions in a way that is more infinite scroll and less like autonomous death robots? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's where we're finding our sweet spot is in this problem of information overload and scaling reading comprehension. Mm -hmm. So if the machine can read through all this information and filter out what is potentially relevant it can provide um, kind of um, uh, a, uh, a tip for the analyst to now go down some other rabbit hole, which is much higher um, probability of finding something useful. Um, so for, ex for example, you might have a foreign adversary that has some sort of investment in multiple subsidiaries that have different names and different domains. It's beyond human capacity to go through all the open source information, try to figure out that they share some sort of um, uh, data point that relates those two together. But that's a uniquely AI. AI is great at that. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can create a knowledge graph um, that that's always learning. Um, you know, and these anomalies now can be used to advance their analysis in ways that they couldn't do before. And that's a very specific type of thing mm -hmm. that, that AI is useful for, information overload. Mm. Yeah, and I think to build on that, we are also then allowing humans to do the things that humans are good at. So taking exactly. into account the context in which you know, the, the, um, the information is being presented, thinking about the potential downstream impacts of a decision. Mm. So if we can let AI do what AI is good at and let humans do what humans are good at, then we solve a lot of these problems. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, time's flying by. Uh, let me get to some audience Q&A so I uh, uh, stop having to think creatively. Uh, <laughs> one of the questions is from a colleague of mine at the Atlantic Council. Uh, he said, nuclear weapons and then precision strike revolutionize warfare because of the destructive power of both, either massively or through greater accuracy on the first shot. In a simple statement, what are the revolutionary qualities AI brings to war as uh, did the other two, that being nuclear weapons or precision strike. And feel free to comment whoever wants to. Speed and scale. I mean, Can you the, elaborate? The ability to do things faster than any human or group of humans could do and the ability to do things at greater scale than any human or group of humans could do. I mean, the AI completely opens up possibilities that we didn't have when, with non-AI enabled systems. Yeah, and I think, you know, just to, to kind of <clears throat> pile on to that point, um, you know, to me, AI is powered by data, which we are now overproducing, mm -hmm. right? We sort of reached this inflection point where we massively overproduce data for humans to be able to consume, to kind of echo back to, to, to your point. And, um, you know, so AI, the, the power of AI, if we get it right, is 
AI works better and better as we give it more and more data. So what overwhelms humans powers AI, and that's really what, you know, to me, where the revolutionary power mm. comes in. Mm. Great. You know, I, I think that the ability to, to estimate um, uncertainty, mm. and hopefully that will contribute to deterrence and preventing action, you know, that's, I don't think we're there yet. Mm. But I, I hope we get there so that, you know, you could look 10 years down the line from now, maybe, maybe shorter, maybe longer, we could look and calculate the risk and, and hopefully we don't see some of the things that we're seeing today. Because you could say that, that might not turn out so well. Mm. And we've used all of the simulation capabilities, all the course of action analysis to know that nobody wins from this situation. Mm. You no, know, it, it, oh, oh, please. Um, no, no, sorry, I was just gonna chime in on that yeah. question. I thought it was a good one because, you know, AI can either, and it's kind of an AI ethics question, more a philosophical one, but, mm. AI can be used to amplify bias or reduce bias. Mm -hmm. And you know, I thought one of the panelists on, on the previous session um, talked about uh, the individualization of warfare, which I thought was really, um, it gets right to the core of the matter, that I, I think nuclear weapons all about you know, mass destruction. Uh, here, you can actually use false narratives and distortions of the truth to manipulate behaviors. Mm -hmm. And that is mm -hmm. kind of a, uh, it, it's a whole different order of magnitude of risk, I think, to humanity, if you really think about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look, and, and actually, that's a great pivot to another question I have here. Um, <clears throat> it, uh, it was not lost to me that the Russians have a tank literally called the Terminator, right? They didn't even try to hide it, uh, <laughs> which is basically a, 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 a gunnery system, an indirect fire system that operates with some layer of AI, et cetera, et cetera. Fine. These things have been, uh, it, I, there was a joke I shared this last week that the, uh, uh, the um, you know, now that the Marines are giving up their tanks, uh, there, there's a new army that has more tanks than the Marines, and that's Ukrainian farmers. Uh, <laughs> and in this case, uh, it was not lost to me that the Russians have all this vaunted technology, and yet they've been relatively easily defeated by Uber-style kind of call, call and support, uh, or call for fire support uh, solutions, software solutions that are delivering mass fires in a, you know at the time of need, right? So I, I guess it, it's a nice segue to this next question from another colleague of mine. Um, from the private sector perspective, uh, so. Feel free to answer this, and if you guys have any uh, two fingers, uh, chime in. Where does the United States stand in relation to China in terms of the operational competitiveness of AI in defense and security? So in terms of operational competitiveness in terms of defense and security. Well, my, my observation, again, from in an unclassified environment, <laughs> <laughs> is that the... Um, you know, adversaries like China are more organized. They've got you know set policies. Mm -hmm. They um, are working systemically from the education levels, early education, to to create an AI centric um, uh, society. Essentially, um, of course, they are using data in in potentially um, you know in different degrees of, of ethics. I mean they're potentially taking their, their people's data to train their machines. They're aggregating large mass data sets. Uh, but I think those data sets are, are fundamentally going to be biased at some level. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are risks in terms of revolution there, you know, if, if they overstep their bounds on that kind of stuff. So um, to answer your question, I don't really know the answer. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> yeah, I don't have an answer. I think there's really this interesting kind of mirror image dynamic between mm. The, the West's attitudes about um, data privacy and ownership mm -hmm. and, and how it's approached in China that are really interesting and they afford opportunities and risks on both sides. You know, for, you know, the Chinese government's actually been remarkably forward-leaning about proposing governance and limitations and ethical rules around private industry's <coughs> use of, of data, for example. So they, sure. they propose more stringent commercial restrictions around you know AI around around data use than than the US mm. government or anything we consider here but on the flip side their view is of course government should have access to all that data mm -hmm. and use it as a substrate to approach government interests and then they take a stake in those companies yeah mm -hmm. of course provide the data potentially 
and they're, you know, they, they have lots of ways of getting you know, what they need. They view mm -hmm. the development of commercial technology as something that just fuels the government and there is no kind of boundary. Um, mm -hmm. If the government needs it, that's the government's right to take to protect the interests of the people. Um, mm. We take a very different view where we protect the IP rights of commercial industry. We tend to be far more concerned about the government having data than private industry having data. Mm. So I think both sides of this, um, uh, both of these kind of the Western and the Chinese approach have you know, relative strengths and weaknesses and it'll be interesting to see how these, how these kind of play out. But they really are different kind of ethical foundational approaches and, mm. and it's interesting how they mirror each other. <clears throat> I, I've seen, uh, I, I've actually done some work in this space uh, and it, it reminded me of what the Germans did after World War I where due to the uh, Versailles Treaty, their entire military force structure was obliterated, right? You're literally riding bicycles and handling broomsticks. Uh, in some ways, we did them, we gave them a, a gift because they eliminated their force structure. So as they evaluated how to achieve their own desired national security aims, they were able to build it from the way they're forced from the way it should be, not the, with what they already had. So what I've seen with the Chinese is have a heavy focus on reinforcement learning as well as uh, something called PSO or particle swarm optimization. So this again gets to that, what we call operational use cases, right? Is you never want to be a solution in search of a problem. So in their case, <clears throat> why would they be investing in PSO? Well, it turns out PSO is really good for two things. Masked indirect fires, like lots of drones, that's code for lots of drones operating autonomously. And the other one is hyper-realistic, uh, what they used to call LVC, live virtual constructive training. And so then you ask, well, why would that be? Well, it turns out the Chinese haven't fought a war since 1979, which they lost to Vietnam. So they, from the ground up, again, as you were saying, you know, they are trying to build their force structure in a way that aligns with how they want to fight um, being unencumbered with uh, existing force structure that they have to kind of design and resource, sustain, and enable. Um, maybe one more question before we wrap up. Uh, this, I think this is a good one. Um, so be, before I read the question, I'll caveat. Uh, we were talking earlier about the, the, these kind of feedback loops of doom, right? Like you put the AI in and you end up with Skynet. And by the way, I recently ran across a tech company that was an AI tech company literally called Skynet. Yeah. And I said, yeah, I just told them, I said, I think you've jumped the shark. <laughs> <laughs> crazy. Uh, uh, in this case, <clears throat> Sure, we don't want autonomous you know, systems firing nukes and obliterating everyone. But then again, there's this cutoff for employment, right? When could we use an autonomous system that even if it ended up in a feedback loop, you know, we already do this with the stock market, right? Because we've, you know, going back a decade, we've had intermittent flash crashes where the algorithms just tank and everything just gets stuck in a downward feedback loop. So in this case, I guess the question is, just as AI can help clear the fog of war, sound familiar? Uh, can't it fog it up, uh, in quotes, by helping with disinformation, jamming, or other things that blur situational awareness? So I guess it's more of like, how, do we, how are we viewing reality, maybe from a political situation as well as a military situation? Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Steve? Um, I, I don't think this is a future consideration. There's a cat and mouse game that's happening today in cyberspace. Um, around, you know, like think about malware and detecting malware and trying to uh, deliver exploits with malware. I mean, that, that's happening today and AI is both an advantage and um, as a defender and it's a disadvantage as a defender because those attacking you are using it as well to try to train to uh, get past your, your systems. Um, so I, I don't think this is a, like a future, this is today, the cat and mouse game happens today. I tend to be um, optimistic that all of these technologies will reduce some aspects of the fog of war that we've known mm. and will introduce, introduce completely new paradigms that we don't know yet. And disinformation, I think, is, is case in point mm. around evidentiary standards and just how will we qualify intelligence in the future? It's a tough problem. 
Ron? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would just note it. It is a great point, right? We've seen how disinformation operating at scale has been used to um, blur and uh, and be used in, you know, it's being used in the war right now in Ukraine. So, and and absolutely, you know, the, the same advantages in speed and scale that make AI a powerful tool for clearing the fog of war can absolutely be turned the other way in the mm. information space, mm. especially when, you know, you think about it's not like disinformation is a new thing. It's really the speed and the number of sources of information that can get interfered with, right? Because, mm. you know, in in World War One, you know, it was a newspaper, and you might try and get false headlines introduced, or maybe sure. introduce some false intelligence into somebody's <coughs> intelligence cycle mm. through, you know. But um, but today, those you know, that information space is so mm. continuous and so and vast that targeting AI the right can influencers, mm -hmm. yeah, with that information to distribute yeah. it. Is yeah, so that that is, I mean, it's a great point that in the information space, AI can really be used to either clear or perhaps increase the fog. Yeah. So with new challenges come new responsibilities for us to monitor for those challenges mm -hmm. and counteract those challenges. So I, th I think that absolutely needs to be part of. You know, when we're developing AI to look at what are the potential ways that that could be countered or used against us and, mm. and to make sure that we're continuously looking for ways to counteract that. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that the, the term viral came from the fact that this information spread in similar uh, logarithmic effects as uh, viruses or epidemiological mm -hmm. models, uh, mm -hmm. which I always thought was interesting. It, Prashant, so you can anything. see it in the yeah. commercial space. I mean, just look at what Reddit did to the stock market uh, with, uh, <laughs> sure. you know, these uh, GameStop. GameStop or sure. uh, even in media and entertainment, somebody wants to be famous, they'll drop a track or something, and then they'll cancel it out and see how people react to it. So, I mean, you have bots and you have all sorts of inauthentic engagement. Mm. And as that, that trend is, only, th those are only going to get smarter. Yeah. You know, and be used for more devious purposes can also be used for good. So, again, another reason we need standards and policies around these things. Mm -hmm. Well, as promised, this flew by. Uh, thank you very much for, for joining us, and thanks to our audience for sticking with us as well. Be sure to check out the report at atlanticouncil.org and uh, stay tuned for more information and reports on uh, defense and national security. Thank you.